your material here, you can, although I'd love for you to show the picture. So I'm going to put this over here, just whatever you're comfortable with. You guys sit down. I'm going to do an opener, and then I'm going to invite you guys to come read. Mason, who's your part? Who's your... Keely and Paris, you guys are partners, right? Becca, yeah. Yeah. Yes, you should sit and listen. Mustafa, who's your partner, Mustafa? Hmm? EJ? EJ will hopefully be here in a minute. We'll start with the one. Good. Okay, Miss Amex, I'm ready whenever you are to get started. Okay, let me know when we're going. So, guys, we're going to start the live stream, start the recording, and have an audience. We're streaming? Okay, hi, hi everyone. Um, welcome to our hope, what will hopefully be the first annual diversity read-in at Collegiate. Today we're gonna read from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., um, all from diverse material, because we strongly believe in the libraries here and in general on campus, we believe that, that people deserve to be represented no matter their sexual orientation, no matter their race, no matter their family situation, no matter where they're from. Um, so just a little bit of log logistics about the day. We will be reading to lower school from 8 to noon. We'll have a series of lower school audiences. And from 12 to 3, it will be middle and upper school readings only. So a little bit more complicated material. And to start us out today, we have some great sixth grade readers. Who wants to start? Becca, yes. Okay, Becca is going to start us out with our first read. Thanks, Becca. Okay, so I'm going to be reading Julian is a Mermaid. The first. Okay. This is a boy named Julian, and this is his abuela. And those are some mermaids. Julian loves mermaids. Vamos, Mijo. This is our stop. Abuela, did you see the mermaids? I saw them, Majo. Mijo. Abuela, I am also a mermaid. I'm going to Take it back. You be good. Julian has a good idea. I'm getting ready. 
in his mermaid costume. Oh! Uh oh. Come here, Mijo. For me, Abuela? For you, Julian. From Grandma giving Julian curls. <laughs> Where are we going? You'll see, says Abuela. Mermaids, whispers Julian. Like you, Mijo, let's join them. And they do. The end. Nineteen seventy five, year of the cat. Today is Tet, the first day of the lunar calendar. Every Tet we eat sugary lotus seeds and glutinous rice cakes. We wear all new clothes even underneath. Mother warns how we act today, foretells the whole year. Everyone must smile, no matter how we feel. No one can sweep, why sweep away hope? No one can splash water, why splash away joy? Is that it? Oh. Today we all gain one year in age, no matter the date we were born. Te, our New Year's doubles as everyone's birthday. Now I am 10 learning to embroider circular stitches to calculate fractions into percentages <clears throat> to nurse my papaya tree to bear many fruits but last night i pouted when mother insisted one of my brothers must rise first this morning to bless our house because only male feet can bring luck an old angry knot expanded in my throat i decided to wake before dawn, to tap my big toe to the tile floor, burst. Not even my mother, sleeping beside me, knew. February 11th, Tet. I was born a miracle, one of billions, but unique. I am human, I am always learning. I'm finding my way and cho choosing my path on this incredible journey. I have big dreams, I see possibility. I have endless curiosity, I make discoveries, I have a feeling of wonder, I am amazed by nature. I have a playful side, I find joy in friendships, I am human. But being human means I am not perfect, I make mistakes, I can hurt others with my words, my actions, and even my silence. I can be hurt too. I can be fearful of things I don't yet understand and, tim and timid to try something new. I have a heavy heart when I feel sadness. I am human. But then I remind myself that because I am human, I can make choices. I can move forward. A poor choice can become a better choice with thoughtfulness. A bad day can become a great day with kindness. I can act with compassion and and lead a helping and lend a helping hand. I can treat others with equal with equality and be fair. 
I can choose not to fight, but instead to listen and find common ground. I say I'm sorry and ask for forgiveness. I am human, one of billions, but unique. I am not alone. I am connected to my friends, to my family, to the world. We are all humans together. And I will keep trying to be the best version of me. I am full of hope. I am human. This is for the unforgettable, the swift and sweet ones, who hurdled history and opened a world of possible. The ones who survived America by any means necessary. And the ones who didn't. This is for the undeniable, the ones who scored with chains on one hand and faith in God. This is for the unflappable, the sophisticated ones, who box adversity and tackle, and tackle vision. Who shine their light for the world to see and don't stop till the break of dawn. This is for the unafraid, the audacious ones who carried the red, white, and blue blues on the battlefield to save the imperfect union. The righteous marching ones who sing, we shall not be moved, but Black Lives Matter. This is for the unspeakable. This is for the unspeakable. This is for the unspeakable. This is for the unlimited, the unstoppable ones, the dreamers and doers, who swim across the big sea of our imagination and show us majestic shores of the pop star. The Wilma Rudolphs, the Muhammad Ali's, the Althea Gibson's, the Jesse Owens's, the Jordans and the Bond, the Serena's and the Cheryl, the Reese Whitley's and the Indiscovery. This is for the unbelievable, the we world cool ones. This is for the unbending, the black as night is beautiful. This is for the underdogs and the uncertain, the unspoken, the no longer untitled. This is for the undefeated. This is for you and you and you. This is for us. We are just doing a quick switch of audience. Okay, okay so you guys hang on. Want to read first? You can read first. Oh. Okay, cool. Is it the first page? Yeah. Here it is. That's the first. Wait, no, this is the Oh, yeah. Is it after? Oh, it should be. <laughs> 
Look at these. I, I have to find greatness. This is amazing. <laughs> how are you guys? Good. good, how are you? You're going to be really good. What book are you reading? We're reading All Around Us. Awesome. Bye. Thank you. Good. All right, you guys. We are going to go ahead and get started. Mason and Warren, thank you guys for yeah. Grandpa says circles are all around us. We just have to look for them. He points to the rainbow that be, that rises high in the sky after a thundercloud has come. He traces the colorful arc with his hands and says, Can you see? That's only half the circle. The rest of it is down below. In the earth where water and light feet feed the new life. That's the part we cannot see. But in my mind, I try. Grandpa and I work side by side in the garden, planting flowers and pulling vegetables. We eat what we've grown, crunchy lettuce, sweet carrots, and spicy chilies. Grandpa says the stems, leaves, and seeds to bury back in the ground. Here is another circle, he says. What we take from the earth, we return. He draws a big circle on his belly with his hand, and I, and a little circle on mine, and says, we even have circles inside. This makes me laugh. Grandpa and I take a walk around the neighborhood where, where we find other circles, the sun, the clock, the bicycle wheels. I'll show you one more important circle, but before the big round moon comes out, Grandpa says, we walk way back in our yard and sit under a tall pecan tree. Grandpa seems sad when he sits here because this is where we, we bury the ashes of our ancestors. I don't remember them, but he does. Even our bodies return to the earth, he says, and pats the ground with his big hands. But that's only half of the circle. That's, that's the part we cannot see. Finally, we walk to the front yard to water our smallest tree. Grandpa planted it for me on the day I was born. And everything that, that fed me while I grew in my mother's belly is buried at the, at the roots. I love, I love being watered to the apple tree. This is already taller than I am. Grandpa pats my head and says, do you see my grandchild? We have new life with you. I'm part of the circle too. The part we can we can see, like a rainbow. And I think that's it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Am I centered on the TV now? Awesome. Hi, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Let's try one more time. Good morning, everybody. That's better. Today I'm reading Our Class is a Family, written by Sharon Olson and Sandy Sonaki. When you think of a family, you might picture one in a house. A mom, a dad, a couple of kids, plus their dogs, 
and a pet mouse. Perhaps you think of grandma or a stepmom and stepdad. It could be those 14 cousins or that twin who makes you mad. But family doesn't have to be who you're related to. It can be another special group who love and care for you. Have you ever thought about where most of your time is spent? It's at school with all of us. That's where all of those hours went. So if our classroom is the place where we spend all of our days, why wouldn't we want to make it like a home in many ways? It's a place where we can show respect and kindness to each other, a spot where we can be ourselves and make memories with one another. We'll have things in common. These are connections that we'll seek. But we'll still celebrate our differences and what makes us unique. Our classroom is a special haven where it's okay to make mistakes. We learn from them and try again, no matter what it takes. We'll all have tough days sometimes, but your teacher is here for you. As long as you're a friend to others, your peers will be there too. In this classroom of four walls, we will stick together. We'll help each other learn and grow in many kinds of weather. So let's always remember what a great team we can be. We have our back. We have yours. What a, we're a classroom family. Thank you. It's going to be. Sorry, I'm having all manner of technical difficulties this morning. I was like, oh my gosh, I, can't, I couldn't get into Zoom. I couldn't, like, Mrs. Fry wasn't left. don't know me. I see a lot of friendly faces right. out there, so I'm glad to see everyone. I thought you guys would be on your field trip almost by now. Leaving soon, right? It's fine. I just need to get a placement. Okay. I'm otherwise. My good. book is called My Whirling I I Twirling Motor. I can't see. And it's by Miriam um, Saunders. I need to switch it. Should I be able to hear anything at this point? Okay. It's really good illustrations. Here's his mom. Hurry, we're late for school. Yep. It should be good. I have a spinning motor All inside right. me that buzzes and okay. whirls and hums. I can't turn it off. It made me play I'm with my dinosaurs so instead of getting my shows, shoes on this morning. It doesn't show them as much. I'm supposed to be getting ready for school. At school, my motor made me wiggle too much during story time. I touched the teacher's scissors. Okay, I talked out of turn. Whirling, spinning, humming. Um, kind of hard for you guys to see, but. All right, I cannot hear her though. At recess, my friends wouldn't play with me because my buzzing motors noises were too annoying. So I threw a ball hard yeah. and hit Nicole in the face by yeah, mistake. Both Ouch. Of the settings, but Sorry, Nicole. They both say that. It's kind of like our playground out there. I can't get it to come through. The twirling and humming made me forget my snack and my lunch and my homework. I would leave the back one. At home, the motor ran me fast around the dining table, running and running and running round and round. Yeah, both off. So dad 
had me sit down and he plunked a box of blocks in front of me. Up and up and up, I kept going higher and higher. And then now they're saying, time for dinner. Charlie, dinner now. I made a tower so high it almost hit the ceiling. Mom and dad came to get me. They had mad faces. He looks like he didn't mean to be so caught up in his blocks. Now it's time for bed. Dad chases me twice around the sofa. Mom tells me to brush my teeth. Bedtime! But I can't sleep. I have a spinning motor inside me that buzzes and whirls and hums. Mom tucks me in and I squiggle and squirm because my motor is busy. Hey there, wiggle worm. I know it's hard for you to settle down. You always move, 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 but I need to talk to you. Uh-oh. Will she tell me all the things I did because of my buzzy motor? I bury my head under a blanket. I wish I could turn off my motor. She takes out a sparkly red notebook and reads from a list. It's titled The Wonderful List. Took your cereal bowl to the sink without being asked. Said thank you when I gave you a glass of milk. Your teacher said you sat still during a spelling and finished your math. You shared markers with Isabel and Miles. You held the door open for Hayden. You ate all your peas and broccoli and you put your blocks away and got into your jammies for dad much quicker today. You brushed your teeth the first time I told you to and I'm very proud of you. My buzzing, twirling, spinning motor settles to a quiet purr and a warm, cozy yumminess spreads. I like this feeling. Mom ruffles my, feet, my hair. You did all that today. I wrote it down to remind us how wonderful you are. I bet I catch you doing all sorts of wonderful things tomorrow too. I dig down into my warm covers. I guess my motor is a little sleepy after all. Good night. Dad says good night. Mom kisses my forehead. They think I'm wonderful. What will be on my wonderful list tomorrow? And that's the end. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Martin, you are reading the second graders. I don't know if you guys can hear Is it Miss Garofalo's class, right? Good morning, Miss Garofalo's class and everyone. I'm Miss um, Martin. I teach fourth and fifth grade science, and I'm Stubby's mom upstairs with the iguana. I'd like to read you a story about, I'd like to read you a story <laughs> about an amazing scientist who became known as the Shark Lady. Her name is Eugenie Clark. Her mother grew up in Japan. Japan is a huge island surrounded by the ocean. Eugenie's mother, Yumiko, loved everything about the ocean. And she passed that love on to her daughter, Eugenie. So I'd, here we go. I'd like to read this book to you. It was Saturday and Eugenie wanted to stay at the aquarium forever. She wanted to smell the damp, salty air and stare at the glittery rainbow of fish. She wanted to keep watching her favorite animals, the sharks. Eugenie pre pretended she was walking on the bottom of the sea. She would, what would it be like to swim with her sharks, to breathe underwater with gills of her own? More than anything, she wanted to find out. When summer came, Eugenie's mother took her to swim at the beach in Atlantic City. Stuffy, sticky gum into her ears kept the water out. Eugenie dove down, down, down. The salt stung her eyes, but she didn't want to miss a single fish. Constellations of sea stars speckled with the pebble sand. She imagined a silvery fin standing strong on her back, slicing the ocean current. To others, sharks were ugly and scary, but Eugenie knew they were beautiful. 
As she glided through the cool water, she wished everyone could see sharks through her eyes. But the sharks were only in her mind. For now, Eugenie decided to learn everything she could about them, so she dove. This time, into books. Whale sharks, nurse sharks, tiger sharks, lemon sharks. Eugenie wanted to know all about them. She also joined the Queens County Aquarium Society as its youngest member. Eugenie's notebooks filled with sharks. They swam in her daydreams and on the margins of her pages. As she grew older, many were still telling Eugenie what to do. Forget those sharks. Eugenie wanted to study zoology, but some of her professors thought women weren't smart enough to be scientists or brave enough to explore the oceans, and they said sharks were mindless monsters. Eugenie knew better. Her dream was as big as a whale shark, so again, Eugenie dove. Despite all the people who didn't believe her, Eugenie was becoming one of the smartest students in her field. Even after she earned her degree, many doubted her. But Eugenie's work was just beginning. Eager to make discoveries of her own, Eugenie finally dove into the open ocean. In the Red Sea, Eugenie collected hundreds of fish, including three new species that had not been discovered. On a research meeting, a mission rather, exploring the Palu Islands, Eugenie was diving alone when she encountered her first ever wild shark. She wasn't afraid. Instead, she thought it was beautiful. In the Isla Mueras, she dispelled the myth that sharks must keep moving to stay alive when she swam through the dark caves, still and silent, full of resting sharks. Sharks. So she proved them wrong, didn't she? Eugenie's daring heart grew bolder with each dive. Soon they began to call her Shark Lady. Eugenie had proven she was smart enough to be a scientist and brave enough to explore the oceans. As her courage drew, grew, she began to love and understand her beloved sharks more and more, but she never forgot many still believed that sharks were mindless killers. Because of their scary reputation, humans were hunting sharks all over the world. Eugenie knew that sharks weren't stupid or mean. She was determined to prove everyone wrong. Eugenie fished through her mind and devised a brilliant experiment. Could she train a shark the way a person trains a dog? Were sharks much smarter than anyone knew? They were. Eugenie was the first scientist in the world to train sharks and even learned they could remember their training for at least two months time afterward. Sharks were not mindless killers. Sharks were beautiful. Sharks were smart. They deserve, de deserve to be studied, protected, and loved. And Eugenie's dream was now a dream come true. I'm gonna drop this book off to you later because there are all these nifty little shark bits that will um, tell you some more cool facts about sharks. And I believe Clark, I think you're an expert in sharks. Anyway, I wanted to show you something really quick. First, I need to put on my shark hat. And then look what I have. I have two shark jaws and, and their teeth are just amazing. They have rows and rows. So I'm gonna drop these off to your room. Miss Garofalo said I could. So I'll be stopping by with my book and these teeth. Thank you for listening. I think you forgot your mask. I'm gonna um, adjust the microphone. Okay. So good morning, second graders, and good morning, audience. This morning, I'm gonna share with you one of my favorite books that I, I had when I first one of the first years that I started teaching, it's called People, and it's simply talking about the differences that we all share. I'm gonna get started with you. I'm gonna update just a little bit of one of the first facts. So it says, we all know there are lots and lots of people in the world and many more millions each year. There are now over seven and a half billion human beings on earth. 
And if it takes you an hour to finish looking at this book, there will be over 4,000 more. Each and every one of us is different from all of the others, each one a unique individual in his or her own right. We come in all sizes and shapes, tall, short, and in between. But without a single exception, we all began quite small. And we come in many colors. Even our eyes have different shapes and colors. And noses come in every shape imaginable. So do faces, lips, and ears, and everything else. Think of our hair from snow white to pitch black, straight, curly, kinky, and wavy. And a lot of people have no hair at all. People are funny. Some with straight hair want theirs to be wavy, and others with little curls want theirs straight. People all around our world wear different clothes, or none at all. All of us want to look our best. Still, what is considered beautiful or handsome in one place is considered ugly or even ridiculous elsewhere. Some of us are wise, some of us are foolish, but most of us are somewhere in between. Most people are decent, honest, friendly, and well-meaning, but some are none of these. Some of us love noise, whereas others simply cannot stand it. And not everybody's idea of a good time is alike. So I'll share the book with you so that you can see the pictures up close, but they're showing all the different activities that people from around the world participate in. People everywhere love to play, but not the same games everywhere. Our tastes are different as day is from night. The homes we build are varied as we are, but we all need a roof over our heads. What makes some people laugh makes others cry. Some of us excel at things others could never do. Many of us like doing things with others while some like being by ourselves. There's a little picture of a guy up here looking out over the ocean in a tent all by himself. We love and keep all sorts of pets. And again, there's pictures of all the different animals that people, people keep as pets around the world. And we celebrate different feasts and holidays. And the thing we like to eat are not always the same. What people in one place consider a delicacy something they really enjoy eating, others would never touch, let alone eat. And the foods some people eat or drink are forbidden by others. We practice nine different religions, nine main religions, and there are thousands of others as well. Many, many people believe in one God, and millions of others believe in many gods, and many millions more don't believe in anything at all. Most of us have to work for a living, and there are more different ways of doing that than you would believe. Most people work hard, but others are lazy, and lots of people who want to work cannot find a job. And some of us are rich, although most of us are not, and very many are desperately poor. I'm going to share one more page and then I'm going to share this book with you and your class so that you can finish it. Almost everybody can speak, but there are 201 different main languages spoken on earth, not to mention the countless variants and dialects spoken by smaller groups. So again, I'll share this book with Ms. Garofalo and Ms. Ojeda, so second graders you can enjoy looking at People, one of my favorite books. Thank you.
Um. <laughs> okay. Well, I am excited to read May Among the Stars, and it is written by Rhoda Ahmad, and it is illustrated by Shadia Burrington. Maybe you can see from that first page what's going to happen. Little May was a dreamer. They say that dreamers never succeed, but Little May was different. One day, May was working on an assignment for school about what she wanted to be when she grew up. What did you tell them, May? I will tell them I want to see Earth. I think they're having cookies there. Mom. This is Earth, May, her mother said. The flowers, the grass, the forest, and the mountains. We live on Earth. I know, but I want to see Earth from out there. There she's pointing to the moon. That's an amazing plan, little May. Then you have to become an astronaut. That way you can see Earth from space. Is that better? Okay. Astronaut? Do you think I could do that? Of course you can. If you can dream it, if you believe it and work hard for it, anything is possible. May asked her mom to take her to the library. See, she searched for books about space and astronauts. Look at that pile of books there. There's a lot of books. After dinner, May drew pictures of space and she even made her own astronaut costume out of old orange curtains and cardboard boxes. Later, she asked her dad, but how do I become an astronaut? It seems impossible. You will find your way, May, because if you dream it, believe in it, and work hard for it, anything is possible. But space is so, so, so far away. It's closer than you think, little May, and you may get there sooner than you think. That night, May had a happy dream. She was dancing in space, surrounded by billions of sparkling stars. Below, she could see Earth rotating and turning like a shining crystal ball. There's May in space and little Earth. The next morning, May told her parents about her dream. She wanted to tell everyone, and every time she talked about it, her eyes would light up. In the classroom, Miss Bell told everyone to stand in a line on the rug. Today, we are all going to share our dreams about the future. What do you want to be and what do you want to do when you grow up? Who wants to go first? I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a teacher. Football player. I want to be a mom. I want to go to space. I want to be an astronaut. All the kids started laughing. Miss Bell asked, May, are you sure you don't want to be a nurse? Nursing would be a good profession for someone like you. Hmm. I don't want to be a nurse. I want to be an astronaut. May felt very disappointed. On her way home from school, May was quiet. She looked out the window. The world turned blue and cold. Nothing was the way it used to be. At home, May started crying. Miss Bell said I can't become an astronaut. What a silly thing to say, said her mother. She told me I should be a nurse instead, said May. Her mom wiped away her tears. My dear May, I hope you didn't believe her. Of course I believed her. She's my teacher. I'm sorry Miss Bell didn't encourage you, but she can't stop you. No one can stop you. Follow your dreams, May, and go to space. Thank you, Mom. I promise when I get to space, I will wave to you and Dad from the spaceship. Her mom took her hand and they started dancing. You must always repeat to yourself, if I can dream it, 
if I believe in it, and if I work hard for it, anything is possible. May went on dreaming, believing, and working really hard. And guess what? She went to space and waved to her mom and dad on Earth. There she is. She became an astronaut. And this is about her, Dr. May Jennison, because this is a true story. It has beautiful pictures, and it's a fun story, but it's true. This happened, and Dr. May Jennison was, is, a space, is an astronaut in space waving to mom and dad. Thank you. Hi, friends. This is Miss Gahan. I'm in the upper school. Is this is it looking okay? <laughs> I can't even tell. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm going to share with you guys one of my favorite books. This is a book called You Matter. And this is something that I am trying to tell my own kids and our students in the upper school all the time that you matter. Your voices matter. Your presence matters. Your impact. All of your actions, they matter. So let's read this story together. You Matter by Christian Robinson. And it's dedicated, I love the dedication too. It's dedicated for anyone who isn't sure if they matter. You do, you matter. The small stuff too small to see. Those who swim with the tide and those who don't. The first to go and the last, you matter. When everyone thinks you're a pest. When something is just out of reach. Can't quite get there. When everyone is too busy to help. You matter. If you fall down. And if you have to start all over again. Even if you are really gassy, you matter. Sometimes home is far away. And that might be Mae, Jem uh, Mae Jemison, who was just in the previous story, the Miss Prince read, the astronaut, right? Sometimes when home is far away, sometimes someone you love says goodbye. Sometimes you feel lost and alone, but you matter. Old and young, the first to go and the last, the small stuff too small to see, all these little ants crawling around, you matter. That's it. One of my favorite books. You guys all matter. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Hi. I have a very special book today called Hello, Goodbye, Dog by Maria Jean Ferrari and pictures are by Patrice Barton. Now this dog is called a therapy dog and we're gonna learn about the special job that he does. Hello, Moose, said Zara. There was nothing Moose loved more than hello. Hello was a ride in the car. Goodbye, Moose, said Zara. It's time for school, but Moose put on her brakes. It took mom and dad to get Moose to leave. There was nothing Moose disliked more than goodbye. Goodbye was an itch that couldn't be scratched. When mom checked the mailbox, out zoomed Moose. It was time to say hello. Two paws patted on the glass. Oh my, said Mrs. Perkins. It's my dog Moose, said Zara. Hello, Moose, said the class.
Hello was a pat on the head. Dogs aren't allowed in school, said Mrs. Perkins. Moose will be quiet, said Zara. She loves story time. Moose lay at Zara's feet as Mrs. Perkins read a story. Goodbye, Moose, said Zara. Moose put on her brakes. It took mom, dad, Zara, and Mrs. Perkins to get Moose to leave. Goodbye was being tied up in the backyard. Moose chewed through the rope. It was time to say hello. Hello, Moose, cried Zara. Hello was having a book and someone to read it to you. Dogs aren't allowed in the library, said Mrs. Chen. Moose will be quiet, said Zara. She likes when I read to her. Zara read, kids listened. Moose's tail swept circles on the rug. Goodbye, Moose, said Zara. Moose put on her brakes. It took mom, dad, Zara, Mrs. Perkins, and Mrs. Chen to get Moose to leave. Goodbye was closing a door. Moose pushed through the screen. It was time to say, Hello. Hello, Moose, said Zara. Hello smelled like homemade cookies. Dogs aren't allowed in the cafeteria, said one of the lunch ladies. She'll be quiet. I'll just read to her, said Zara. Zara read. One kid sat then another and another until the table was full. Moose's tail thumped on the floor. What's that dog doing here? asked Principal Evans. It's time for goodbye, Moose, said Zara. But Moose was tired of goodbye. A game of tag was on. Principal Evans was it. Chairs tipped, kids slipped, teachers tripped, trays flipped, and Moose skipped right back to Zara. Then Moose got tagged. Goodbye, Moose, said Zara. It took mom, dad, Zara, Mrs. Perkins, Mrs. Chen, Principal Evans, and all the lunch ladies to get Moose to leave. Goodbye was tag without an it. Goodbye was tug and no war. Goodbye was hide without seek. Goodbye was being alone. Oh, yowled Moose. She needed to say hello, but Zara wasn't there. Hello, Moose, said Zara. I know you don't like goodbyes, and I have an idea. Zara took Moose to therapy dog school. Moose was tested on her temperament, check, on sitting, lying down, staying, check, on being with children, check, on being around wheelchairs, check, check, double check. 
Finally, Moose was ready. The next day, Moose joined Zara in the classroom. Hello, Moose, said the class. Mrs. Perkins, Miss Chen, Principal Evans, and all the lunch ladies. They welcome class reading dog and they have moose. So today was hello. All right, thank you. Hello, goodbye dog. <laughs> Okay, hello friends. Hi, it's Miss Shoemaker. You guys maybe recognize me better if I'm holding a camera because I usually see you guys while I'm taking pictures. But I am here to read Not Quite Narwhal. And this is my daughter, Lila's, one of her very, very favorite books. So, can you see? Not Quite Narwhal. Kelp was born deep in the ocean. There's Kelp. He knew early on that he was different from the other narwhals. His tusk wasn't as long as everyone else's. He had different tastes in food, and he wasn't a very good swimmer. But his friends didn't seem to mind, so Kelp decided he wouldn't either. That is until he was swept away by a strong current. I wish I were a better swimmer, he says. Kelp found himself at the surface, closer to land than he had ever been before. High up on a cliff, he spotted a mysterious sparkling creature. It looked so familiar. It looked like kelp. Kelp swam toward the land as fast as he could, which wasn't very fast at all hoping that he could catch up with the creature that looked just like him. When he finally reached the shore, Kelp felt a little bit anxious. He had never left the ocean. He was ne nervous about walking for the first time, but the land creatures made it look so easy. And you can see he's trying to walk and he's stumbling. So he tries to walk like a crab. Oof, it wasn't easy. Ow, like a frog. Eventually, he got the hang of it. Everything on land was strange and beautiful, but also kind of scary. Kelp began to think he might never find the creature that looked just like him. But as he stumbled out of the forest, land narwhals! He found all kinds of land narwhals just like him. Actually, we're unicorns. And by the looks of it, so are you. Kelp had never heard of unicorns before. They taught him all sorts of new things about his tusk. We call them horns. Wow. They introduced him to unicorn delicacies, like snow cones, and they showed him how to gallop. There was no doubt that Kelp was, in fact, a unicorn. He was having so much fun that he didn't want to leave. But then he remembered all of his friends under the sea. Kelp missed them terribly. He had said goodbye to the unicorns and returned to the ocean. And they said, come back soon. Kelp swam toward home as fast as he could, which wasn't very fast at all, hoping that the narwhals would still like him now that he was a unicorn. When he finally arrived, Kelp had butterflies in his stomach. But guess what? They had a big sign that said, Welcome home, Kelp! They were like, Kelp, you're here! Kelp took a deep breath and told his friends the news. It turns out, I'm not a narwhal. Of course you're not. I'm a unicorn. We all knew that. They took it quite well. Kelp was happy to be home, but now that he'd experienced life on land with the unicorns, he couldn't seem to forget them. Did he want to be a land narwhal with the unicorns? 
or, did, or a sea unicorn with the narwhals? Kelp couldn't decide, but then he realized that maybe, just maybe, he didn't have to choose. And so there's the ending of the book, and you see all the narwhals, the land narwhals and the sea narwhals playing together. I hope you enjoyed the book. Thank you. Oh, and this is my favorite. I forgot this part, guys, if you're still there. It's the end, and there's a rhinoceros, and he says, I'm a unicorn. And Kelp says, um, bye. <laughs> Hi guys, we now have fourth graders and kinder their kindergarten buddies here and the fourth grade is going to read to their kindergarten buddies. Linear time by Monkey Gray Smith and Cree, and it's in Cree and Lakota, and pictures by Nicole Needhart, Navajo. This book is also written in Dinan. Can you guys stand back to the microphone? Hi. Linear kind. On the gray carpet. Yep. I am kind when I help my family. I am kind when I share with my friends. I am kind when I take my dog for an extra long walk. I am kind when I help my neighbor. I am kind when I bring food to my elders. 
I am kind when I I I am kind when I only take from the earth what I need. I'm kind when I take care of myself and get a good night's sleep. I feel joy when my family and I are kind. I feel happy when my friend is kind to me. I feel comfort when my cat is kind to me. I feel loved when my elders are kind to me. I feel grateful when the earth is kind to me. I feel respectful when I am kind to myself. When we are all when we are kind, we remember we are we are all related. The end. Formation, 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 formation. formation. Uh, I think I've been. And the Liam, you're right there. I'm right here. I'm right here. Okay, so this book is called The Mountain's Base, and it's by Tracy Sorrell. And illustrated by Wesh O. Yut. And I mean, and his last name is. I'll be dry. I'll be dry. I don't know. Um, let's just. We need. Wait. Is this... Okay. At the mountain's base grows a hickory tree. Beneath this sits a cabin. Um, just a In that cabin, there, in that cabin lies a cozy kitchen where a stove's fire warms. On that stove simmers savory goodness in well-worn pans. By those pans sits a grandma weaving. And worrying. Around that grandma gathers a family, tending and staying. In the song, unfold to battle, testing and demanding. In that battle, soars a plane, climbing and driving. Diving. Diving. Gosh. Now let's get on. Inside that plane flies a pilot, protecting and defending. Within that prayer, within that pilot forms a prayer, pleading. Peace. Because at the mountain's base, beneath the hickory tree, sits a cabin.
And in that cabin huddled the family, waiting for her return. In this page, um, the pilot is is going home after the war. The roots that ground us help us soar. That was the pig on the back. My heart fills with happiness. By Monique Graysmith, Cree, and Lakota. Pictures by Julie Let Cree Mate. My heart fills with happiness when I see the face of someone I love. I smell, I I smell bannock baking in the oven. I sing. My heart fills with happiness when I feel the sun dancing on my cheeks. I walk barefoot on the grass. I dance. My my heart fills with happiness when I hold the hand of someone I love. I listen to stories. I drum. What fills your heart with happiness? The end. We are just transitioning classes, so give us just a minute to get settled.
wait, Miss Hendricks is gonna read you guys a book. Oh, yay! Uh, like the good old days. Like the good old days. I am peace. I Ms. love Hendricks, this you, book. Could you oh. stand back behind the microphone? Yeah, I can. A book of mindfulness. Hendricks could turn the pages with her cold hands. It would work better. There are times when I worry about what might happen next and what happened before. Eyes on the book. You'll see the pictures. The thoughts in my head are like rushing water, and I feel like a boat with no anchor. being carried away i give myself a moment i take a breath and then i tell myself it's all right i feel the ground beneath my feet and i steady myself and start to notice the here and the now my thoughts begin to settle and my mind begins to clear. I am peace. Eyes on the book. I can watch my worries gently pop and disappear. I let things go. I can say what I feel inside out loud. I know myself. I can share kindness with others. I make a difference. Gotta be watching the pictures to get the story. See what's happening. I can hug a tree and thank it for its beauty and strength. I connect to nature. I can watch the clouds make shapes against the sky. I know wonder. I like to wonder in kindergarten. I can taste and smell and touch and hear and see what is all around me. I use my senses. I can feel my breath fill my whole body. I tune into me. Now the water is still. I have found my anchor and everything is all right. I don't need to worry about before or after. I am in this moment. I am peace. And I dream that we our peace. I'm sorry I didn't tell you. That's by Susan Verde. And the art is by Peter Reynolds. What a great story. We All Play by Julia Flett of uh, Free. Animals hide and hop. And sniff and sneak. And peek and peep. We play too. And we'll swim and squirt. <clears throat> and bubble and bend.
and chase and chirp. We play too. And we'll slip and slide. And rumble and roll. And wiggle and wobble. We play too. Animals wrestle and roost. And nudge and nuzzle. Yep, and yawn. And, and slowly, slowly, side by side, animals fall asleep. We do too. Z, 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 Z. Kevin Noble Mallory, illustrated by Kalana Martinez Neal. How to call honor of honor. Fry bread is food. Flour, salt, water, cornmeal, baking powder, perhaps milk, maybe sugar, all mixed together in a big bowl. Fry bread is, sh is shape. Hands mold the dough flat like a pancake, round like a ball, or puffy like Nana's softest pillow. Fry bread is sound. The skillet clings on the stove. The fire blazes from below. Drop the dough in the skillet. The bubbles sizzle and pop. Fry bread is colored. Golden brown, tan, or yellow. Deep like coffee, senna, or earth. Light like snow and cream. Warm like rays of sun. Fry bread is flavor. See beans or soup. Smell tacos, cheese, and vegetables. The light and honey and jam. Rise to discover what discover what brings us together. Fry bread is time. On weekends and ho holidays, supper or dinner. Festivals, moments together with family and friends. Fry bread is art, sculpture, landscape, portrait, or daily craft. Shared from teacher to student, a cycle of heritage and fortune. Fry bread. Wait, 
That's the right answer. For our is history, the long walk to stolen land, strangers in our own world, unknown food, we made new recipes from what we had. Fry bread is place, Alaska, Kansas, all the way to Maine, Just down to Delaware, on to Georgia, over Oklahoma, Colorado, and California, cities and lands we all call home. Fry bread is nation. Hundreds and hundreds of tribes. Fry bread is everything. Round, flat, large, small. North, south, east, west. Brown, yellow, black, white, similar, familiar, and foreign. All the new, we come together. Our bread is us. We are in Stokia, elder and young, friends and neighbors. We strengthen each other to learn, change, and survive. Kevin's fry bread. One pint warm water. One cup cornmeal. One half a one and a half cups of cold water. A half. Wait. A half. A half. A half ounce of dry, dry or instant yeast. Um, one cup raw sugar, one teaspoon sea salt. Three and a half cups of, of flour, 32 ounces unrefined coconut oil. Little you. you by Richard Van Camp, illustrated by Juliet Black. Little you, little wonder. Little wish, gentle thunder. You are mighty, you are small. You are ours, after all. Little star with little wings. Let's all dance, let's all sing. You are life and breath adored. You are us and so much more. Little ember with growing light. Feel our love as we hold you tight. You are the birth of everything new. You, you are, are perfect. perfect. You, you are you. Are you.
your buddies a hug, high five, whatever you want to do. We'll see you next week. Monday, right? Monday. Monday and Friday. 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 We are transitioning once again for a new kindergarten and fourth grade pair. Ooh, microphone. Cool. You hold me up. By Monique Gray Smith. Lakota Cree. Illustrated by Danielle Daniel Metis. You hold me up. You hold me up. You hold me up when you are kind to me. When you share with me. When you learn with me. You hold me up when you play with me. When you laugh with me. When you sing with me. You hold me up when you comfort me.
when you listen to me. When you respect me. You hold me up. I hold you up. We, we hold each, each other up. up. The end. Water Protectors, written by Carol Win Lindstrom, illustrated by Michelle Gardet, okay. Gardet, Clingit. We are water protectors. We are water protectors. Water is the first medicine, Nakomi told me. We stand with our songs and our drums. We are still here. The, ryth the river's rhythm runs through my veins, runs through my people's veins. My people talk of a black snake that will destroy the land. Poison, spoil the waters, spoil, poison the plants and the animals, wreck everything in its path. When my people per first spoke of the black snake, they foretold that it wouldn't come for many, many years. We m take courage. I must keep the black snake away from my village's waters. I must rally my people together. To stand for, to stand for the water, to stand for the land, to stand as one against the black snake. We stand with our song and our drums. We are still there. We are it, still here. It will not be easy. We fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. The winged ones, the crawling ones. The four-legged, the two-legged, the plants, trees, rivers, lakes. We are, we are, we are all related. Tears like waterfalls stream down, tracks down my face, tracks down my people's face. Water is alive. Water remembers our ancestors. Water has its own spirit, Nakomi's told me. Water is alive. Water remembers our ancestors who came before us, she said. We stand with our songs and our drums. We are still here. <coughs> we are seaweeds of earth. Our <coughs> spirits have not been broken. We are water protectors. We stand. The black snake is in for a fight of its life. The end. Yes, that's our only one. So, this one is called We Are Grateful it's by Tracy Sorrell, 
and it's illustrated by Frenet Lissac. Sorry. He's got a door here. <laughs> Cherokee people say Ojalahiriga to express gratitude. It is a reminder to celebrate our blessings and reflect on struggles daily, throughout the year, and across the seasons. Fall. When cool breezes blow and leaves fall, we say Ojalahiriga. As shell shakers dance all night around the fire and burnt cedar scent drifts upward during the great new moon ceremony. As we clean our houses, wear new clothes, enjoy a feast, and forget old quarrels to welcome the Cherokee New Year. While we collect buckbrush and honeysuckle to weed baskets, to remember our ancestors who suffered hardship, on, well, hardship and loss on the Trail of Tears. And have hope as our Elisi grandma cradles the newest member of the family and reveals his Cherokee name. As bears sink deep in snow blankets the ground, we say, Odelahiriga. While elders share stories and we savor buttery bean bread and steamy comedy soup. As older children teach the younger ones how to make corn husk dolls and play in trees. While we gather to remember an uncle who has passed on, as men cuddle babies and sing traditional lullabies in Sally Therapy. Spring. The showers fill springs and shoot spring up. We say, While men sing, asking for thunder and lightning protection of the emerging sprouts that women tend. As we gather wild onions, spring's first food, and serve them with pin bags. As we practice patience to sew pucker toe moccasins and boil clay to build beautiful crops. As we plant strawberries, an ancestral story, sweet smelling reminder not to argue with each other as we embrace a clan relative heading off to serve our country. Summer. As the crops mature and the sun scorches, we say, Ojala Julia. When we grasp our gigs and wade into the pool pit to catch crawdads for supper, as we sink our teeth into the season's first harvest, as a green corn ceremony. While we click clack sticks, chasing a small ball and swing it high as a stick ball game pole. When we recall our ancestors' sacrifices to preserve our way of life, to celebrate history and listen to our tribal leaders speak at the Cherokee National Holiday. Every day, every season, Ojo the Juliga, we are grateful. They seem to focus more chasing things. So I'm talking into the microphone. Okay. So this goes directly to the feed. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Live language? I'm so excited. Tell me when to start. Or is a new group coming in? Or am I just looking at the camera? Okay. No worries. So I'm looking here. Yes. Okay. 
Okay. Your audience. Okay, you tell me when. Okay. Good morning. My book today is called Introducing Teddy, A Gentle Story About Gender and Friendship. The author is Jessica Walton, and it's illustrated by Dougal McPherson. Errol and Thomas the Teddy play together every day. They ride their bike in the backyard. They plant vegetables in the garden. They have sandwiches for lunch in the treehouse. And they have tea parties inside when it's raining. One day, Errol woke to find the sun shining through his bedroom window. Hooray, he shouted. Come on, Thomas, let's go to the park and play. Thomas the Teddy didn't feel like playing. You seem sad today, Thomas, said Errol. Don't worry, the park will cheer you up. Thomas the Teddy wasn't so sure. Oh no, even the swing isn't working. What's wrong, Thomas? Talk to me. If I tell you, said Thomas, you might not be my friend anymore. I will always be your friend, Thomas. Thomas the Teddy took a deep breath. I need to be myself, Errol. In my heart, I've always known that I'm a girl Teddy, not a boy Teddy. I wish my name was Tilly, not Thomas. Is that why you've been so sad? Errol asked. No I don't care if you're a girl Teddy or a boy Teddy. What matters is that you are my friend. You're the best friend a bear could have, said Tilly. Now that you're feeling better, said Errol, let's call our friend Ava. Hi, Ava, Teddy and I are at the park. Do you wanna come and play? Sure, Errol, let me just fi finish building my robot. Hi, Errol. Hi, Thomas, Ava called out as she sped towards them. Hi, Ava, said Errol. Teddy has a new name. Let me introduce you to Tilly. What a great name, said Ava. Let's go and play, Tilly. Wait, I'm just moving my bow tie, said Tilly the Teddy. I've always wanted a bow instead. Well, good for you, Tilly. Wear whatever makes you happy, said Ava. I think I'll get rid of my bow. I like my hair free. Errol, Ava, and Tilly played all morning until it was time to go home. See you at our next tea party, Errol said as Ava stepped into her scooter. Yes, see you there. I'm bringing a friend, Ava yelled as she sped away. Errol and Tilly the Teddy play together every day. They ride their bike in the backyard. They plant vegetables in the garden. They have sandwiches for lunch in the treehouse. And they have tea parties inside when it's raining. The end. Good to go. Okay. I'm super excited about this story. Um, Lubna, Lubna and Pebble. Um, I like this story because it reminds me of my son when he was in kindergarten because he, we moved to a new country and he didn't speak the language and he used to talk to the rocks and um, that was really special for him. And so this story is also about a pebble. Lubna's best friend was a pebble. It was shiny and smooth and gray. 
Lubna found it on the beach when they arrived in the night. Then she fell asleep in daddy's salty arms. When Lubna opened her eyes, it was morning. They had landed in a world of tents. Lubna clutched daddy's hand and gripped her pebble. Somehow she knew they'd keep her safe. In a big white tent, Lubna found a felt tip pen. She drew a happy face on her pebble. Hello, pebble, whispered Lubna. Pebble smiled back. Lubna told Pebble everything about her brothers, about home, about the war. Pebble always listened to her stories. Pebble always smiled when she felt scared. I love you, Pebba. Pebble, Lubna said with a sigh. Then the winter arrived. The winds began to blow. The tents began to flap. Daddy said, come close, I'll keep you warm. But Lubna was worried. What if Pebble gets a cold? That must never happen, said Daddy. He went and found a shoebox and a tea towel. Thank you, Lubna grinned. Then she put Pebble to bed and kissed it goodnight. Soon, a little boy arrived. At first, he had no words, just blinks and sneezes and stares. This is my best friend Pebble, Lubna said. The little boy coughed and sneezed, then smiled. Hello, Pebble. My name's Amir. Lubna and Amir became friends. They played hide and seek underneath the stars. But at bedtime, Lubna whispered to Pebble, you are still my best friend. One day, Daddy was beaming. We are leaving. We have found a new home. Lubna felt happy, then sad, Amir cried. That night, Lubna couldn't sleep. She asked Pebble what to do. Pebble didn't answer. But by the morning, Lubna knew. Lubna gave Amir the shoebox with Pebble and the pen. What do I do if Pebble misses you? asked Amir. Draw the smile back on, said Lubna. What do I do if I miss you? Tell Pebble all about it, Lubna said. Amir nodded and held the shoebox tight. Goodbye, Pebble, Lubna whispered. Hello, Pebble, Amir said. The end. I'm going to read Gaston. Gaston. Words by Kelly DiPuccio and pictures by Christian Robinson. Mrs. Poodle admired her new puppies. Beefy, Fufu, Ooh La La, and Gaston. Would you like to see them again? Beefy. Fufu, ooh la la, and Gaston. Perfectly precious, aren't they? Mrs. Poodle thought so too. The puppies grew, as puppies do. Three were no bigger than teacups. The fourth, however, continued to grow and grow until he was the size of a teapot. Mrs. Poodle took pride in teaching her puppies how to be proper pooches. They were taught to sip, never slobber. Good. Well done. Very nice. Nice try. They were taught to yip, never yap. Yip, yip, yip. Rough. Something a little different about that pup. And they were taught to walk with grace, never race. Toe, tippy toe. Whoa! The puppies were also taught how to be pretty in pink, nibble their kibble, and ride in style. Whatever the lesson, Gaston always worked the hardest, practiced the longest, and smiled the biggest. 
Mrs. Poodle was very pleased with all her puppies, Fifi, Fufu, Ooh La, and Gaston. Spring arrived and the proud mother was eager to show off her darlings. She took them to the park for their very first stroll in public. There was much to see, daffodils, ducklings, dogs. Oh dear, what do we have here? Rocky, Ricky, Bruno, and Antoinette. Would you like to see them again? Rocky, Ricky, Bruno, and Antoinette. This was more than a little awkward. The mother sized up the pups. The pups sized up one another. It seems there has been a terrible mistake, Mrs. Bulldog said, breaking the silence. We oui, we oui, said Miss, Miss Poodle agreed sadly. Whatever shall we do? Mrs. Bulldog could not come up with an answer. I guess we'll let them decide, she replied at last. Gaston and Antoinette were young, but even they could see that there had been a mix-up. The two puppies began to circle around and around the group. Gaston walked with grace. Antoinette raced. Gaston yipped. Gaston yapped. And when they finally came to a stop, the puppies had traded places. There, that looked right. It just didn't feel right. That evening, Antoinette tried to fit in with her new sisters, but she did not like anything proper or precious or pink. Silly. On the other side of town, Gaston tried to fit in with his new brothers, but he did not like anything brutish or brawny or brown. Ick. Antoinette, Antoinette and Gaston weren't the only ones who were having a hard time adjusting. The next morning, Mrs. Poodle forgot all about being proper and raced back to the park. Mrs. Bulldog was already there with her burly brood. It seems we've made a terrible mistake, she nearly shouted. Wee oui, wee, oui, Mrs. Poodle agreed happily. This time, Gaston and Antoinette wasted no time trading places. There, that looked right and felt right too. From that day forward, the families met in the park every afternoon to play. Rocky, Ricky, Bruno, and Antoinette taught the poodle puppies a thing or two about being tough. Likewise, Fifi, Fufu, Ooh La La, and Gaston taught the bulldog puppies a thing or two about being tender. And many years later, when Gaston and Antoinette fell in love and had puppies of their own, they taught them to be whatever they wanted to be. You guys have your books ready? Everybody's ready to read? I'm going to push you guys a little bit further back to change the angle a little of the video. Yeah. Yes, you can take off your mask. <laughs> <laughs> 
I wouldn't land on my on the boat. Oh. It's stuck on my ear. Okay, wait, just a minute I'm gonna get a Oh, yeah, you do? Wait, okay, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Say hi and just introduce the book. Okay. Wait, we supposed to be two or one page. Wait, when are we supposed to start? You can start anytime. Okay, hold on. Okay. <laughs> what do you want me to introduce? There you go. Okay, hi. <laughs> We're reading Pedos Pedos. So, yeah. Okay. Pedos Pedos. <laughs> Muchos Pedos. Pero Grande, Pero Chico. A uh, big dog, little dog. A uh, donde van? Arriba, abajo, up, down. Por el pueblo, through the town. Espera! Wait. Mas peros, pero anocho, pero estrecho. A donde van? Arriba, abajo, por el pueblo. Espera. Mas y mas peros. Pero rápido, pero lento. Pero limpio, pero sucio. A donde van? Arriba, abajo. Por el pueblo. Did you read it? Yeah. Okay. Mas y mas peros. Pero mojado, pero seco. Pero negro, pero blanco. Pero liso, pero rosado. Oh, no, sorry. Arriba, abajo, por el pueblo. Lad ladrando. Brincando. Splash, splash. Fin. <laughs> Open. <laughs> Thank, <Okay>. thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Wait, do I stand here? What? I like. Wait, hold on. Okay, wait. Do I do like that? Oh, there's a camera, so you're like, yeah. God, Ashley, stop being so bad. Okay, so I'm reading La Mariposa Linda. Ayer que fuimos al campo, vi una linda mariposa. Pero ella, al verme tan cerca, voló y voló persuosa. Do I read the English? The pretty butterfly. Yesterday I went to the field. I saw a beautiful butterfly. But on seeing me so close, it flew ever so quickly away. Los pescaditos. Los pescaditos andan en el agua, nada, nada, nada. Vuelan, vuelan, vuelan. Los chiquitos, chiquitos. Vuelan, 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 nadan, nadan, nadan. Little fish. Little fish move in the water, swim, swim, swim. Fly, 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 little ones, little ones. Fly, 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 swim, swim, swim.
Los Palitos. Los Palitos dicen pio pio pio. Cuando tienen hambre, cuando tienen frío. La gallina busca el maíz y el trigo. Les da la comida y les presta abrigo. Acreditos baja las dos alas. Hasta el otro día duermen los palitos. The chicks. When little chicks say peep, 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 when they are hungry, when they are cold, the hen looks for the corn and wheat. She gives them food and she keeps them warm. Huddling under her wings, they sleep until the next day. La luna. Aquí viene la luna. Comiendo tuna. Echando la caracas. En esta laguna. The moon. Here comes the moon. Eating prickly pear fruit. Throwing the waste into the pond. Gracias. Okay. Hi, this is Si yo tuviera un dragon. If I had a dragon. Morton juega con tu hermana. No quiero jugar con mi hermano. Es muy pequeño. Ojalá se convertiera en no, an algo divertido. Como un papalote nuevo, un, o una excavadora o. Un dragón. Si yo tuviera un dragón, sería tan feliz. Podríamos ir de paseo. Hmm, hmm. Podríamos jugar a baloncesto. Oh, ah. Uh. Ir a nadar. Ouch, I. Jugar. Al escondite, listos allá. Voy. ¿Y al cine? Uh oh oh. Silver. Al fin y al cabo, quizás un dragón no sea el mejor compañero de juegos. The end. Gracias. So we're going to be reading a few traditional Spanish nursery rhymes from Pio Peep. Pito, pito, calorito. Pito, pito, calorito. ¿Dónde vas tú, tan bonito? Voy al campo de la era, a la escuela 
ver dandera. Good morning, early bird. Good morning, early bird. This delight. Where are you going so busy and bright? To school in the meadow? I'll add up the seeds and study the spiders and measure the weeds. Aredoa, areda. Alaredoa, areda. De pan y canela. Dame un vestito y vete a la escuela. Y si no quiero ir, acueste a dormir. Bread and cinnamon, bread and cinnamon. This is the rule. Give me a kiss and hurry on to school. If you want to sleep instead, I won't wake you, sleepyhead. Cinco pulitos. Tiene mi tía. Uno le canta, otro le pía. Y tres le tocan la termina. A rum tum tum, whistles and sticks. My auntie makes music with five little chicks. One is a singer, another can hum. Three pet play the melody, rum a tum tum. Charcoal, char charcoal, saca tus cuernos al sol. Poke your head, your head out, little one. Time to say good morning, son. Cinco lobitos, cinco lobitos, tiene la loba, blancos y negros, detrás de la cola, cinco tenía y cinco crió, y al pequeñín um, sopitas le dio, five little wolf pups, five little wolf pups, white and black, each little pup had a tail in black, mother made soup for each little pup, but the littlest wolf just gobbled it up. Alamendras y turón, palmas, palmitas, hongos y castinitas, almendras y turón para mi niño son. Mm. Um. Almondo, almonds and chestnuts, patty cake, patty cake, cookies for sale, almonds and chestnuts and figs and pale, cinnamon, marshmallows, strawberry treat, Mommy makes a co mommy makes cookies for somebody sweet. Tortillitas para mama. Tortillas para mama. Tortillas para papa. Las celentitas para mama. Las doraditas para papa. Tortillas for mommy. Mommy likes tortillas, steaming hot and yummy. Make them round and nicely browned for daddy's hungry tummy. Aquí puso la pajarita el huevo. Aquí puso la pajarita el huevo. Este lo agarro, este lo partió, este lo cocino. Esta le echo la sal y este picardo gordo. Se Lo comio. Here the bird laid the egg. Here the bird laid one round egg. This one found it. This one cracked it. This one cooked it. This one put salt on it. This and this fat rascal gobbled it up. So the camera is there. Okay. 
You let me know when I'm gonna try to explain where I'm from and all that. Okay, hi, I'm Valeria. I'm from Argentina and I'm gonna show you where Argentina is in the map. You see, we are up here in Argentina, so all the way down here. You know where the penguins live? Well, that's where I'm from. We're famous for soccer, I like soccer, and also for cows, we love our beef. That's why I'm gonna read a song, um, a book, The Old, Old McDonald's, pero en español. Old McDonald's had a farm. Okay, that one. You ready? So, El... Viejo McDonald's tenía una granja, ia, ia, oh. Y en esa granja tenía una oveja, be, ia, ia, oh. With the bed, bed here and the bed, bed there, bed, 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 bed everywhere. Oh, McDonald's, oh, viejo McDonald's tenía una granja, ia, ia, oh. Y en esa granja tenía una vaca, mu. Ia, ia, oh, with the moo moo here and the moo moo there. Oh, moo moo aquí, moo moo allá, moo moo all the time. Oh, viejo McDonald tenía una granja. Ia, ia, oh, y en esta granja tenía caballos. Oh, caballos, horses. Ia, ia, oh, with the, oh, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Aquí, he, allá, he, everywhere, everywhere, sin cesar. El viejo McDonald's tenía una granja. Ia, ia, oh. Okay, gracias. Hi, I'm Rocio La Lama. I'm not going to dance today, <laughs> but I'm going to read a book that I know that you know about. This is the pigeon. I know that you know him. He's very, very brave, trouble pigeon. So we're going to talk about him. And I know that you know this book. It's um, the pigeon doesn't want to take a bath. So in Espanol, la paloma necesita un baño. Look at that. So his friend said, Hola, no sé si te has fijado, pero la paloma está muy sucia, muy sucia. Así que me iría bien que me ayudaras, porque la paloma necesita un baño. The pigeon needs a bath. So he said, es cuestión de opiniones. It's all about matters. So he said, qué bromista, what fun. En realidad no necesita ningún baño. He is so, so, I uh, refuse to take a bath. So he said, I don't need a bath. Ya me bañé el año pasado. What's going on? I take a bath last month. Give me a break. Bueno, creo que no fue el mes pasado. He's doubting about that. Limpio, sucio, solo son dos palabras. Limpio means clean, sucio means dirty. What do you think, friends? Yo me siento limpio, he said. I feel clean. Do you think he is clean? I don't think so. A lo mejor eres tú quien necesita un baño. He is mad and now he is asking, maybe you need a bath. See, so he's going to ask us, ¿Cuándo fue la última vez que te bañaste? Oh, so we can say yesterday in the morning. So he said, oh, pues hace muy poquito. So he's wondering if he's wrong right now. La vida es muy corta. ¿Por qué de perder el tiempo en cosas sin importancia? So now he is saying, life is very short. Why can I spend the, my time taking a bath? It's, 
It's not. I'm not gonna take it back. So he starts smelling. Ooh. So somebody said, oh, que olor. So he starts saying, yo no huelo nada. Yo no huelo nada. It's not me. Yo no huelo. Y si oliera a algo, es un olor muy normal. So he thinks that being stinking is very normal. I'm a pigeon. ¿Sabes que hay sitios donde bañarse no es de mala educación? Now, he is arguing that in some places, uh, it's not, it doesn't matter if you don't take a shower or a bath. So look at the stinky bees, Ooh, the stinky flies. Todas estas moscas volando a mi alrededor son pura coincidencia. It's not me. The bugs are not for me. And the flies start, ooh, que asco, guacala, uy, no. So the little stinky one said, date un baño. So get a shower. So now he is mad and said, OK, de acuerdo, me voy a bañar. Si para ti es tan importante, me voy a bañar. So see, for you, it's a big deal. I'm going to take a shower. So now he is in the bathroom. So he saw the bathtub. Esto no me va a gustar. He said, no, I don't think this is going to life. So look at that. He started arguing. It's too cold. Está muy frío. Está muy tibio. Muy caliente. No me gusta. Está muy hondo. No me veo. Pero en fin. And then he get in the, in the bath. In the bathtub. Wow. What do you think? So he said, anda, qué divertido, limpio, limpio, relimpio, I'm very clean. Wow, me gusta. He's singing in, in, in the bathtub. Esto es vida. This is life. He likes the bubbles. And he's looking at his fingers. Okay. Okay, now he's saying, I'm not a pigeon, I'm a fish. And 10 hours later. Diez horas después, he asked, ¿Puedo quedarme más tiempo? Can I stay more? Thank you. Vamos a leer el libro Te Quiero. Este es un libro de Scholastics en español. Te quiero. Yo te quiero. I love you. Te quiero. Escrito por Bernadette Rossetti e ilustrado por Carolina Jane. Yo te quiero. I love you. Te quiero. Yo te quiero. Te quiero de la cabeza, all the way, hasta los pies. Te quiero. What is te quiero? I love you. Muy bien. Te quiero cuando estás feliz, cuando estás muy bien. Y cuando estás triste. Oh, no. Te quiero cuando estás enojado. Y te quiero cuando estás triste. Te quiero desde los dedos de la mano hasta los dedos de los pies. Te quiero. Te quiero desde las orejas. Te quiero desde mi nariz. Te quiero. 
Te quiero desde mi cabeza, desde mi pelo. Te quiero cuando estás feliz. Oh, te quiero cuando estás triste. Yo te quiero. Te quiero cuando corres. Corre, corre, corre. Te quiero cuando caminas. When you walk despacio. Te quiero. Te quiero cuando estás en silencio. Y te quiero cuando hablas y cuando estás feliz. Yo te quiero. Hoy, ayer y mañana. Te quiero. Hoy, today, ayer, yesterday y mañana. Tomorrow. Yo te quiero. So, what is the new word we learned today? Te quiero. What does that mean? I love you. Bonjour. My name is Madame Hoven and I am a French teacher and I'm going to share with you a book about France. Our book is called A Poodle in Paris. A Poodle in Paris. Picture a poodle in Paris. That's the place for a poodle to be. And the most perfect poodle in Paris is known as La Grande Fifi. If you were to see her, you'd surely shout, the most wonderful poodle alive. If you were to ask her, where is your home? She'd stop and say, oh, I have five. Five homes, you say? How can that be? One home's enough for the most doggies like me. Five homes is perfect, she'll say with a sigh. Come with me through Paris, and then you'll know why. Her first home is a bistro with Madame and Pierre. She has croissant and chocolat for breakfast down there. Oh la la, says Madame as she cuddles Fifi while Pierre sings her songs and calls her ma chérie. Number two is a shop on the Champs Elysees where the finest of dresses are out on display. Lulu is famous for fashion and style, and for Fifi, who sits in her window a while, Lulu shares her coffee in a tiny white cup. They've done since that since Fifi was just a small pup. Home threes with the pigeons and Madame Baguette by the Grand Eiffel Tower is where they all met. We love you, Fifi, she coos every day, for you never bark meanly or chase us away. Then there's Rex and there's Charlie and Collie's one more, three friends on a boat that is home number four. When the bateau mouche sails, they bark at the shore. Fifi's happy with friends on the river once more. Number five is the bow wow. That's easy to see. There's a sign that says, um, of the grand Fifi. The bow wow is a club with a bichon frise band that plays wildly so Fifi can dance the can-can. For if you're a dog, there's no greater delight than to watch Fifi dance every Saturday night. So if you're ever in Paris and you have the chance to go out with your dog and watch Miss Fifi dance, don't ask about home, for you must understand she has one for each finger you have on your hand. For whether you've got one home or five, four or two, with sisters or brothers, or maybe just you, fancy or plain, bistros or boats, in the city or out where you find cows and goats. Each home is special, says La Grande Fifi. I won't part with any place where they love me. For some dogs stay put, and some dogs will roam. But you where you is happy, where your heart is happy, is where you call home. So I hope you enjoyed this little book about Paris. Um, 
France is one of my homes. I have my mom and my dad that live there. And Paris is one of my favorite cities in the world. And as you read through this story, maybe you got a, a little few different pictures of different parts of Paris. Like here, you might see the famous Notre Dame Cathedral. And here in front of it, you can see some work by different artists. And then over here, do you see this, these stairs that go down? This is down to the Metro, the underground railroad that goes through Paris. Maybe you also heard about the food in the cafe. They're drinking chocolat and eating a croissant. And then next it talked about the Champs-Élysées that's full of famous stores where you're gonna find all kinds of clothes and dresses and all amazing things. And then next, you may have seen in the background, the Eiffel Tower. And here's Madame with her baguette, her French bread. And then another place they talked about here was the Bateau Mouche, these little boats that sail up and down the river. If you ever go to Paris, you should definitely go for a ride on the Bateau Mouche. You can see so much of Paris from sitting on the boat. And then you saw the dancing that takes place in Paris. So lots of different places. I hope you enjoyed my book and I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about Paris and La Grande Fifi. So guys, we're transitioning to eighth grade readers, which we're excited about. You're gonna stand at the microphone and you're reading to the camera. I think there are still JKers watching and this is a perfect book for JK. You ready? <laughs> um, this book is called Lola Plants a Garden. Lola loves her book of garden poems. Her favorite poem is the one about Mary Mary. Lola wants to plant a garden. Mommy says that there's room near the vegetables. Lola gets book about gardens from the library. She chooses her favorite flowers from the books. Mommy makes a list. They go to the garden store to buy seeds. Lola and Mommy make the garden. The seed packets mark where the flowers are planted. Lola will have to wait a long time for them to grow. Lola makes her own flower book while she waits. Mommy types the Mary Mary poem and Lola glues it in. Lola makes a string of bells. She finds shells and some old beads and even makes a little Mary Mary. One day Lola sees tiny green shoots. She pulls up weeds so the shoots can grow. Lola's flowers grow bigger. They open up to the sun. Daddy helps Lola hang her shiny bells. Lola finds Mary Mary a special spot. It's just perfect. Orla, Ben, and Ty are coming to see Lola's garden. Lola and Mommy are making cupcakes. Lola wears her flower shirt. Mommy helps Lola with her hair. Lola's friends love everything about her garden. They share the crunchy peas and the sweet strawberries that mommy grew. Lola makes up a story about Mary Mary. What kind of garden will Lola plant next? Uh, this is I Am Enough by Grace Byers. I Am Enough. Like the sun, I'm here to shine. Like the voice, I'm here to sing. Like the bird, I'm here to fly and soar high over everything. Like the trees, I'm here to grow. Like the mountains, here to stand. Like time, I'm here to be and be everything I can. Like the champ, I'm here to fight. Like the heart, I'm here to love. 
like a ladder here to climb and like the air to rise above. Like the wind, I'm here to push. Like a rope, I'm here to pull. Like the rain, I'm here to pour and drip and fall until I'm full. Like the moon, I'm here to dream. Like a student, here to learn. Like the water, here to swell. Like a fire, like a fire here to burn. Like a winner, I'm here to win. And if I don't get up again, I know that I may sometimes cry, but even then, I'm here to try. I'm not meant to be like you. You're not meant to be like me. Sometimes we will get along, and sometimes we will disagree. I know that we don't look the same. Our, our skin, our eyes, our hair, our frame. But that does not dictate our worth. We both have places here on earth. And in the end, we are right here to live a life of love, not fear. To help each other when it's tough and to say together, I am enough. I am peace a book of mindfulness. There are times when I worry about what might happen next and what happened before. The thoughts in my head are like rushing water and I feel like a boat with no anchor being carried away. I give myself a moment, I take a breath, and then I tell myself, it's all right. I feel the ground beneath my feet and steady myself and start to notice the here and the now. My thoughts begin to settle, my mind begins to clear. I am peace. I can watch my worries gently pop and disappear. I let things go. I can say what I feel inside out loud. I know myself. I can share kindness with others. I make a difference. I can hug a tree and thank, and thank it for its beauty and strength. I connect to nature. I can watch the clouds make shapes against the sky. I no wonder. I can taste and smell and touch and hear and see what is all around me. I use my senses. I can feel my breath fill my whole body. I tune into me. Now the water is still. I have found my anchor and, and everything is all right. I don't need to worry about before or after. I am in this moment. I am peace. Now I share my peace with others and hope that it is carried away to those who need it. And I dream we are peace. This book is called Prince and Knight. Once upon a time, in a kingdom far from here, there lived a charming prince who was handsome and sincere. His parents knew that soon it would be time he took the throne, but with a kingdom so grand, the prince could not rule alone. So the three of them set out and traveled far and wide on a quest to find the prince a kind and worthy bride. The prince met many ladies, and he all made them all swoon, but it was soon clear that he was singing a different tune. Thank you, he told his parents. I appreciate that you tried, but I'm looking for something different in a partner by my side. But while the worlds were away, 
the land faced quite a scare from a dragon fast approaching, breathing fire everywhere. All the villagers ran in fear, even the soldiers hid and fled. This vicious beast is far too great. We must retreat or we'll be dead. The prince heard the dreadful news, and he raced home with all his might to protect his precious realm. The prince was ready for a fight. Alas, before you fear our prince had to face the beast alone, along on horseback came a knight cloaked in armor that brightly shone. The dragon charged upon our heroes, thinking that it had already won. But the knight had a bold idea, and raised his shield to face the sun. The glare hit the shining metal, blinding the dragon's fiery eyes. But it was what the prince did next that really caught it by surprise. The prince had climbed atop the dragon and tied a rope around its head. He wrapped the cord around the neck and down the body like a thread. The plan had worked. The dragon was caught, its body tied and bound, but the prince up high had lost his grip and was falling to the ground. The knight below jumped on his horse and they began to race. The prince was caught, free from harm, held in the knight's embrace. You saved my life, and you saved mine, they said to one another, and in a flash, to each had felt there was simply no other. The knight took off his helmet to reveal his handsome face, and as they gazed into each other's eyes, their hearts began to race. As the villagers returned, it became clear to those around that the prince's one true love had at last been surely found. The king and queen had come back too and were overwhelmed with joy. We have finally found someone who is perfect for our boy. And on the two men's wedding day, the air filled with cheer and laughter for the prince and his shining knight would live happily ever after. The end. Hi, I'm Miss Hendricks from Kindergarten, and I'm going to read Hair Love. It's by Matthew A. Cherry and illustrated by Vashti Harrison. My name is Zuri. I have hair that has a mind of its own. It kinks, coils, and curls every which way. Daddy tells me it's beautiful. That makes me proud. I love that my hair lets me be me. In funky braids with beads, I'm a princess. And when my hair is in two puffs, I am above the clouds like a superhero. My hair even does magic tricks. One day, Rocky and I were playing outside when along came the rain. From large to small it went, presto, just like that. There's nothing my hair can't do. Daddy was still sleeping, shh, I said to Rocky as we tiptoed past him. Lately, Daddy has been worn out. He makes me breakfast, takes me to school, goes to work, picks me up, and yesterday we went for a bike ride around the park. I think he needs a break. Because today is special. I want a perfect hairstyle. This calls for a professional's touch. So she gets her iPad. Paws off, Rocky. Crack. Daddy hears the, heard the crash. Zuri, what on earth, he asked. I was only trying to help, I said. Daddy smiled, can I help too? It'll be a piece of cake, Zuri. The first style was a big no way. The second was no better, no, Daddy. Then Daddy tried slicking my hair back in two puffs, ouch! Daddy yelled. A rubber band popped him in the eye. Wait a minute, said Daddy said as he reached into the drawer and pulled out a pick. Ta-da! Daddy, really? I said. I'll be right back, he promised. 
Now, how's that, he asked, pulling a hat down over my eyes. Danny, come on, we can do better than that. I really need my hair to be special. Don't worry, he said, we'll figure this out. Then I had a great idea. Daddy gathered all the tools we needed and we were set. Watching carefully, Daddy combed, parted, oiled, twisted. He nailed it. Funky puff buns. Pretty, pretty, and so much fun. Rocky approved too. Click. I put on my superhero cape as a final touch to a perfect look. Where's my Zuzu? Mommy called from the door. She could not get in the house fast enough. Mommy! You've got to be the prettiest Supergirl I have ever seen, she said. And your hair is beautiful, Zuri. Who did it? I looked at Daddy and beamed. Mommy smiled very nice. Thank you. We learned from the best, Daddy said as he gave her a big hug. My hair is mommy, daddy, and me. It's hair love. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Alan L. Hart, 1890-1962. When he was young, Alan was known as Lucille. His parents named him that because they thought he was a girl. But Alan didn't feel comfortable in his own body. He didn't feel comfortable because he felt as though he was trapped in a girl's body. Can I cut my hair and be a boy? He'd ask his mom. She wouldn't listen. When he had to go to school, Alan was, first, was forced to wear girls' clothes. He struggled throughout his years there, and to cope with this problem, he lost himself in his studies, especially science. That hard work earned him a place at, at a university where he met and fell in love with a woman. But when Alan wore the boys' clothes he preferred, she left him. Struggling, Alan went to visit, Alan went to visit a psychiatrist named Dr. Gilbert. After a lot of tests and questions, Dr. Gilbert diagnosed Alan as transgender. It didn't mean that the body he was in didn't match how he felt inside. According to Dr. Gilbert, Alan had been born a boy in a girl's body. Dr. Gilbert firmly believed that the opposite could be true too, where girls were born in the bodies of boys. Alan just wanted to be accepted for the man he was and to be allowed to study and practice medicine. So Dr. Gilbert performed an operation on him. Alan became one of the first ever transgender people to have their body changed to match how they felt inside. As well as studying medicine, Alan channeled all of his experiences into novels that became bestsellers. He fell in love with a woman, married her, and they lived together for, for 37 years. During that time, he conducted groundbreaking work on a disease called tuberculosis and saved a lot of lives. Society made life difficult for people like Alan, but that never stopped Alan from doing everything he could for society. Hi guys, I'm gonna be reading Under My Hijab in a second. 
Okay, perfect. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to be reading Under My Hijab. Grandma peeks into the oven as the brown loaf of bread starts to rise. Her hijab is careful, carefully folded like the crust on my favorite pies. When she is at home in her kitchen, Grandma fixes her hair in a bun. We mix up some chocolate cookies and we share a sweet treat when they're done. Mama jokes with her patient as she peers in his ears and throat. Her bright pink hijab looks so cheerful tucked into her tidy white coat. At home, Mama lets her long hair down as she rolls up the sleeves on her sh shirt. While we laugh, we plant pretty flowers and make a big mess with the dirt. Auntie works in the hard in her studio. She's always dressed funky and cool. Her silky hijab towers up high, pinned with a handmade jewel. I help hang my very own painting on the wall of her colorful home. Auntie's hair is streaked pink and, pink and purple, a fine art work of art she can comb. Jenna is our fearless troop leader. She makes the gooeyest s'mores. Her hijab is top of the sun hat whenever we hike outdoors. The dark falls, we huddle together and share spooky stories all night. Jenna's hair glows as she whispers. I shiver and hold her arm tight. My sister Zaina in high school wears something stylish each day. She puts on a fashionable outfit and wraps her hijab in a cute way. Zaina ties up her hair in the evening when she takes a short break from her book. Then we dig through her clothes in the closet to find something for tomorrow's fresh look. Iman tries to learn her first... Earn her first black belt, a sporty hijab frames her face. When she cracks a board into pieces, I'm amazed how her job stays in place. At home, we dance to some music. I teach Iman the moves that I know. My cousin's curls bounce, jump, and tumble as we put on our private show. These wonderful girls and smart women inspire me with all that they do. I can wear my hijab like each of them or try something totally new. Under my hijab and a headband or a clip with butterfly wings, my hair shines bright like my future. I can't wait to see what it brings. That's it. Thank you. Okay, so this book is called The Day You Begin. There will be times when you walk into a room and no one there is quite like you. Maybe it will be your skin, your clothes, or the curl of your hair. There will be times when no one understands the way words curl from your mouth, the beautiful language of the country you left behind. My name is Rigo Berto. We just moved here from Venezuela. And because they don't understand, the classroom will, will fill with laughter until the teacher quiets everyone. Rigoberto from Venezuela. Your teacher says it's so soft and beautifully that your name and homeland sounds like flowers blooming the first bright notes of a song. There will be times when words don't come. Your own voice, once huge, now smaller. When the teacher asks, what did you do last summer? Tell the class your story. We went to France, Chela says. These shells came from a beach in Maine. A boy named Jonathan holds out a jar filled with tiny shells so fragile, they look like they'll turn into dust in your own untraveled hands. My whole family went to India, Spain, South Carolina. Each souvenir is a small triumph of a journey. Your travel's going on and on. And as you stand in front of that room, you can only remember how the heat waved as it lifted off the curb. In your days spent at home caring for your little sister, made you laugh out loud and hugged you hard at nap time. You can only remember the books that you kept up reading long after she had fallen asleep. And in that book, when no one else is quite like you, you look down at your empty hands and wonder what good is this when other students were flying and sailing and going somewhere. And there will be times when the lunch your mother packed for you is too strange or too unfamiliar for others to love as you do. Uh, when even your own friend Najda will wrinkle her nose and say, what's in there anyways? And you'll wonder how she doesn't see the rice beneath the meat and kimchi. You'll wonder why she doesn't remember that rice is the most popular food in the world. 
There will be times when the climbing bars are too high, the run is too fast and far, the game isn't one you can ever really play. I don't want him on my team. You can watch. Maybe you can have a turn later. There will be times when the world feels like a place that you're standing all the way outside of. And all that stands beside you is your own brave self, steady as steel and ready, even though you don't know what you're ready for. There will be times when you walk into a room and no one there is quite like you until the day you begin to share your stories. My name is Angelina and I spent my whole summer with my little sister, uh, little sister, Italo class, your voice stronger than it was a minute ago, reading books and telling stories. And even though we were right on our blog, it was like we got to go everywhere. Your name is like my sister's, Roberto says. Her name is Angelina too. And all at once, in the room where no one is quite like you, the world opens itself up a little wider to make some space for you. To, this is the day you begin to find the places inside your laughter and your lunches, your books, your travel, and your stories, where every new friend has something a little like you and something so fabulously not quite like you at all. This book is called Drum Dream Girl. A, a pounding tall conga drums, tapping small bongo drums, and boom, boom, booming with long, loud sticks on big, round, silvery, moon bright timbales. But everyone, everyone on the island of music in the city of drum beats believed that only boys should play drums. So the drum dream girl had to keep dreaming quiet, secret drum beat dreams. At outdoor cafes that looked like gardens, she heard drums played by men, but when she closed her eyes, she could also hear her own imaginary music. When she walked under wind wavy palm trees in flower, in flower bright park, she heard the whir of parrot wings, the clack of wood pecker beaks, the dancing tap of her own footsteps and the comforting pad of her own heartbeat. At carnival, she listened to the rattling beat of towering dancers on stilts. And the dragon clang of costumed drummers wearing huge masks. At home, her fingertips rolled out their own dreamy drum rhythm on tables and chairs. And even though everyone kept reminding her that girls on the island of music had never played drums, the brave drum dream girl dared to play tall conga drums, small bongo drums, in big, in big round silvery moon bright tambales. Her hands seemed to fly as they ri rippled, wrapped, and pounded all the rhythms of her drum dreams. Her big sisters were so excited that they invited her to join their new all-girl dance band. But their father said only boys should play drums. So the drum dream girl had to keep dreaming and drumming alone. Until finally, her father offered to find a music teacher who could decide if her drums deserved to be heard. The drum dream girl's teacher was amazed. The girl knew so much, but he taught her more and more and more. And she practiced and she practiced and she practiced. Until the teacher agreed that she was ready to play her small bongo drums outdoors at, at Starlight Cafe then, that looked like a garden. Where everyone who heard her dream, dream bright music sang and danced and decided that girls should always be allowed to play drums in both girls and boys should feel free to dream. I'm reading Where Are You From? Where are you from, they ask. Is your mom from here? Is your dad from there? 
they ask. I'm from here, from today, same as everyone else I say. Know where you are really from, they insist. I ask Abuelo because he knows everything. And like me, he looks like he looks like he doesn't belong. Where are you from? Abuelo thinks his eyes squint like, like he's looking inside his heart for an answer. You come from Pampas, the open free land, he says. Where, where from Guacho, brave and strong from the brown river that cleans and fe feeds the land that gives us the grain for our bread, the milk from the cows. You're from mountains so high, they tickle Sen Senor Kelo's belly, where the condor root roots his family and the ja jaguar prowls, prowls the night. But you're also from the warm blue oceans, the copper warriors try to tame, and the elegant palm trees stretch their fingers to carry. You're from hurricanes and dark storms, and tiny seeing frog that calls the island people home when the sun goes to sleep. From the from the land where our ancestors built a home for all, even when they were enchained because of the color of their skin. You're from the grandmother who searched for their grandchildren, waiting, always waiting in a plaza, their white handkerchiefs wrapped, raping the sorrow of their thoughts. You came from sunshine and light that lights the our path in in this world and and the rain that washes away your mistakes. But Abuela, I asked, where am I from? Where am I really from? Abuela laughs. I want a place. You want a place. He points to his heart. You're from here, from my love and the love of all those before us. From those who dreamed of you because of a strong song under the Southern Cross, of the words in a book written under the light of the North Star. You, you are from all of us. I am. <laughs> so there is, just so you guys know, there's a third grade class in the lower school library here. Yeah. So that, that's your, you guys, uh, you're an audience as well. Yes. No, thank you. All right. So I'm going to be reading Change Sings, a children's anthem by Amanda Gorman and uh, pictures by Lauren Long. All right.
I can hear change humming in its loudest, proudest song. I don't fear change coming, and so I sing along. I scream with the skies of red and blue streamers. I dream with the cries of tried and true dreamers. I'm a chant that rises and rings. There is hope where my change sings. Though some don't understand it, those windmills of mysteries, I sing with all the planet and its hills of histories. I hum with a hundred hearts, each of us lifting a hand. I use my strengths and my smarts, take a knee to make a stand. I'm bright as the light each day brings. There is love where my change sings. I show others tolerance, though it might take some courage. I don't make a taller fence, but fight to build a better bridge. I talk not only of distances from where and how we came, I also walk on differences to show we are the same. I'm a movement that roars and springs. There's a wave where my change sings. Change sings where? There inside me, because I'm the change I want to see. As I grow, it grows like seeds. I am just what the world needs. I'm the voice where freedom rings. You're the love your bright heart brings. We are the wave starting to spring, for we are the change we sing. We're, we're what the world is becoming, and we know it won't be long. We all hear change strumming, won't you sing along? Thank you. I'm going to be reading a book called Entango Makes Three. In the middle of New York City, there is a great big park called Central Park. Children love to play there. It has a toy boat pond where they can sail their boats. It has a carousel to ride in the summer and an ice rink to skate on in the winter. Best of all, it has its very own zoo. Every day, families of all kinds go to visit the animals that live there. But children and their parents aren't the only families at the zoo. The animals make families of their own. There are red panda bear families with mothers and fathers and furry red panda bear cubs. There are monkey dads and monkey moms raising noisy monkey babies. There are toad families and toucan families and cotton top tamarine families too. And in the penguins house, there are penguin families. Every year at the same time, the girl penguins start noticing the boy penguins. 
and the boy penguins start noticing the girls. When the right girl and the right boy find each other, they become a couple. Two penguins in the house were a little bit different. One was named Roy and the other was named Silo. Roy and Silo were both boys, but they did everything together. They bowed to each other and walked together. They sang to each other and swam together. Wherever Roy went, Silo went too. They didn't spend much time with the girl penguins. The girl penguins didn't spend much time with them. Instead, Roy and Silo wound their necks around each other. Their keeper, Mr. Gramsci, noticed the two penguins and thought to himself, they must be in love. Roy and Silo watched how the other penguins made a home, so they built a nest of stones for themselves. Every night, Roy and Silo slept there together, just like the other penguin couples. And every morning, Roy and Silo woke up together, but one day, Roy and Silo saw that the other couples could do something they could not. The mama penguin would lay an egg. She and the papa penguin would take turns keeping the egg warm until finally it would hatch, and then there would be a baby penguin. Roy and Silo had no egg to sit on and keep warm. They had no baby chick to feed and cuddle and love. Their nest was nice, but it was a little empty. One day, Roy found something that looked like what the other penguins were hatching, and he brought it to their nest. It was only a rock, but Silo carefully sat on it and sat. When Silo got sleepy, he slept, and when Silo was done sleeping and sitting, he swam and Roy sat. Day after day, Silo and Roy sat on the rock, but nothing happened. Then Mr. Gramsci got an idea. He found an egg that needed to be cared for, and he brought it to Roy and Silo's nest. Roy and Silo knew just what to do. They moved the egg to the center of the nest, and every day they turned it, so each side stayed warm. Some days, Roy, Roy sat while Silo went for food. Other days, it was Silo's turn to take care of the egg. They sat in the morning and they sat at night. They sat through lunchtime and swam in swim time and supper. They sat at the beginning of the month and they sat at the end of the month and they sat all of the days in between. Until one day, they heard a sound coming from inside their egg. Peep, 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 peep it said. Roy and Silo called back, squawk, squawk, peep, peep, answered the egg. Suddenly, a tiny hole appeared in the egg's shell, and then... Crack! Out came their very own baby. She had, a fuzzy, she had fuzzy white feathers and a funny black beak. Now Roy and Silo were fathers. We'll call her Tango, Mr. Gramsci decided, because it takes two to make a tango. Roy and Silo taught Tango how to sing for them when she was hungry. They fed her food from their beaks. They snuggled her in their nest at night. Tango was the very first penguin in the zoo to have two daddies. Soon Tango grew strong enough to leave the nest. Roy and Silo took her for a swim, just like all the other penguin families. And all the children who came to the zoo could see Tango and her two fathers playing in the penguin house with the other penguins. Hooray, Roy. Hooray, Silo. Welcome, Tango, they cheered. At night, the three penguins returned to their nest. There they snuggled together, and like all other penguins in the penguin house and all the other animals in the zoo and all the families in the big city around them, they went to sleep. That's the end.
Hi, so um, this is a book. It's called Maddie's Fridge, and it is by Lewis Brannett. Yes. Um, When Sophia and Maddie played at the park, they stretched their toes to the sky, they climbed to the tops of ladders and flew off the edge of the slide. They stayed until the buildings grew long, shadows, and even the taxis stopped honking. Let's play on the climbing wall, Maddie said. No way, Sophia said. I can't reach. Yes, wait, Maddie scooted up to the top of the wall. Your turn. Sophia put a foot on the um, bottom rock, grabbed with one hand, and stretched, but she couldn't reach the next hold. Sophia's stomach ground. I give up. Let's get a snack. No way, Maddie said. Let's stay here. Yes, wait. Sophia ran to Maddie's building and raced up the stairs. Wait, Maddie ran after her. Maddie was the best climber, but Sophia was, fa was the faster runner. Sophia swung open the door and Maddie's fridge, of Maddie's fridge. What have you got? We have milk, Maddie said. I'm saving it for Ryan. He's still little. Why does your mom, why doesn't your mom go to the store? Sophia asked. We don't have enough money. What if you get hungry? We have some bread, Maddie said. I guess I'll go home to eat, Sophia said. Please don't tell anyone, Maddie said. Sophia ran home past the bookstores and grocery stores. The sun went down behind the buildings and took the, all the colors with it. Good timing, Mom said. Dinner's almost ready. Louise was wrestling the floor, on the floor with pe um, Pepito. Sophia opened the refrigerator door. Pepito peeped inside. Sophia's fridge was full of milk and eggs and tortillas and cheese and lettuce and jam and salsa and tofu and even half a can of dog food. Here you go, Mom said. Sophia and Louise each had a plate of fish and rice. Mom had a plate of fish and rice. Even Pepicho had his bowl of dog food with a little bit of rice and fish. Maddie and Ryan only had some bread and a small carton of milk. Sophia couldn't tell Mom that she had to keep her promise to Maddie. Not fish again, Louise said. I want cheesy pizza bombs. Cheesy pizza bombs are a treat, Mom said. Fish is a source of protein. Is fish good for kids, Sophia asked. Yes, Mom said. Fish is perfect for kids. That night, Sophia had an idea. Yuck, Maddie said the next day. Oh, Sophia said, double yuck. Fish may be good for kids, but fish is not good for backpacks. After school, Sophia and Maddie raced to the climbing wall. Sophia got there first, but Maddie scrambled past her to the top. Sophia stretched and stretched. Keep trying, Maddie said. You'll get it. I can't, Sophia. Jump down. It's too high. That night, Sophia, Luis, and Mom ate frittata. Pepito had his dog food with a little bit of frittata. Maddie and Ryan still had an empty refrigerator. Sophia couldn't ask for help. That would break her promise. She had to try again. Are eggs good for kids, Sophia asked. Uh, Mom said, eggs are good for you. After dinner, Sophia packed eggs for, for Maddie and Ryan. Yuck, Maddie said. Double yuck, Sophia said. Eggs may be good for kids, but not, eggs are not good for backpacks. Sophia and Maddie raced to the climbing wall. Sophia won again, but Maddie shot past her to the top of the wall. Sophia grabbed one and reached for the next and came down with a thud. That happens sometimes, Maddie called. This is impossible, Sophia said. Keep trying, Maddie said. You'll get it. That night, Sophia, Luis, and Mom had burritos. Pepito had his dog food. 
Maddie and Ryan still had an empty fridge. Sophia wished she hadn't promised Maddie. Are burritos good for kids? Sophia asked. Burritos are very good for you, Mom said. Not as good as Lee started to say. You should pay attention to nutrition like your sister, Mom said. The next morning, Sophia put two burritos in her backpack along with tortillas, beans, cheese, and even some milk. Um, no thanks, Maddie said. You haven't even looked, Sophia said. Is it fish? Maddie asked. No. Is it eggs? No. Is it gross? I don't know, Sophia said. Maddie shook the backpack. Something sloshed. Let's look together, Maddie said. One, two, three, go. Burritos are good for kids and good for backpacks, too. Do you want some milk, Sophia asked. Thanks, Maddie said, but I'll save the milk for Ryan. Sophia and Maddie raced to the climbing wall. Sophia won as usual and tried to climb. You can do it, Maddie said. Take my hand. Woohoo. I made it to the top, Sophia shouted. We're the tallest kids in the park, Maddie said. Thanks for helping me, Maddie. I couldn't do it alone. Maddie shrugged. That's what friends are for. Oh. After they finished playing, Sophia went home past the bookstore to and the grocery store. Her own fridge was full of milk and juice and chicken and yogurt and bread and carrots and even half a can of dog food. She thought and thought and thought. Maddie's fridge only had two tortillas and a cup of beans and a bit of cheese and a little bit more milk than before. Sophia didn't want to break her promise, but she couldn't help Maddie alone. Sophia told. She hoped Maddie wouldn't be mad. I'm glad you told me, Mom said. Let's see what we can do together. They loaded a grocery bags with milk flour chicken carrots sugar oil and even frozen meat and vegetables louise pulled his package of cheesy pizza bombs out of the freezer freezer he thought and thought and thought some more then he put his um cheesy pizza bombs in Addie and ryan's bag for a treat he said At Maddie's apartment, the bombs talked. Louis and Ryan played. Sophia and Maddie ran to the park. You broke your promise, Maddie said. I'm sorry, Sophia said. Are you mad? A promise is important, Maddie said. You're you're more important, Sophia said. I wanted you to have milk too. You to have milk too. Maddie smiled. Are we still friends? Sophia asked. Always, Maddie said. Double always, Sophia said. Cheesy pizza bombs, Louis yelled. Our moms made cheesy pizza bombs for a treat. Sophia and Maddie raced up the stairs. Sophia slowed down. They c could run together. That's what friends were for. The end. <laughs> Okay, so this is an excerpt from The Reason I Jump. And The Reason I Jump is written by Naoki Higashida, a very smart, very self-aware, and very charming 13-year-old boy with autism. It is a one-of-a-kind memoir that demonstrates how an autistic mind thinks, perceives, and responds in ways few of us can imagine. Why do people with autism talk so loudly and weirdly? People often tell me that when I'm talking to myself, my voice is really loud, even though I still can't say what I need to and even though my voice at other times is way too soft. This is one of the things I can't control. It really gets me down. Why can't I fix it? When I'm talking in a weird voice, I'm not doing it on purpose. Sure, there are some times when I find the sound of my own voice comforting when I use familiar words or easy to say phrases. But the voice I can't control is different. This one blurts out not because I want it to. It's more like a reflex. A reflex reacting to what? To what I've just seen in some cases or to some old memories. When my weird voice gets triggered, it's almost impossible to hold it back. And if I try, it actually hurts, almost as if I'm strangling my own throat. I'd be okay with my weird voice on my own, but I'm aware that it bothers other people. 
How often have the strange sounds coming out of my mouth embarrassed me nearly to death? Honest, I want to be nice and calm and quiet too. But even if we're ordered to keep our mouths shut or to be quiet, we simply don't know how. Our voices are like our breathing, I feel, just coming out of our mouths unconsciously. Thank you. I'm going to be reading The Color of Us. My name is Lena and I am seven. I am the color of cinnamon. Mom says she could eat me up. My mom's the color of French toast. She's an artist. Mom's teaching me how to mix colors. She says that if I mix red, yellow, black, and white paints in the right combination, I will have the right brown for a picture of me. The right brown? But mom, brown is brown, I say. That's not so, mom says. There are lots of different shades of brown. Let's take a walk and you'll see. We go to the playground where we see my friend Sonia. Sonia is a light yellow brown, mom says, just like creamy peanut butter, I say, my favorite. Isabella is chocolate brown like the cupcakes we had for her birthday. Lucy has skin that's peachy and tan. My best friend Johan lives close to the playground. Johan is the color of honey. Two streets over, we meet my cousin Kyle. His skin is a reddish brown, like leaves in fall. Carlos and Rosita have brought their new puppy to the park. Carlos is a light cocoa brown and Rosita's skin looks like butterscotch. When we pass by the pizza parlor, mom and I see Mr. Pellegrino flipping a, high, a pizza high in the air. He is the color of pizza crust, a golden brown. My babysitter Candy is like a beautiful jewel, bronze and amber. She looks like a princess. Mom and I walk to the park to eat our lunch. Look at everyone's legs, Mom. All the different shades. After lunch, we walk to Mom's favorite store, where Mr. Cashmere sells many different spices. He's the color of ginger and chili powder. Up the street is my Aunt Kathy's laundromat. Aunt Kathy is a tawny tan, like coconuts and coffee toffee. After our walk, my friends come over. We take our towels to the roof and lie in the sun. I think about everyone to I saw today. Sonia, Isabella, Lucy, Johan, and Kyle, Carlos and Rosita, Mr. Pellegrino and Candy, Mr. Cashmere and Aunt Kathy, each one of them a beautiful color. My friends leave and I go downstairs. I'm happy as I get out my paints, yellow, red, black, and white. I think about all the wonderful colors I will make, and I say their names out loud. Cinnamon, chocolate, and honey, coffee, toffee, and butterscotch. They sound delicious. At last, my pictures are done, and I've painted everyone. Look, Mom, I say, the colors of us. Thank you. Okay. My name is Jordan Gray, and I'm going to be reading um, Outside Inside by Lewin Pham. Something strange happened on an unremarkable day just before the season changed. 
everybody who was outside was inside. Everyone everywhere, all over the world, everyone just went inside and shut their doors and waited. Well, almost everyone. Some people needed to be where they needed to be. Outside, the sky was quiet, but the wind still blew and the birds kept singing. Raccoons came out and squirrels played in the street, but the car stayed away. The little world felt a little different. Inside, we baked and cooked, made music and watched TV, reread and play games. Some of us worked a little, some of us worked a lot, and some of us couldn't work at all. We all felt a little different. Outside there were fences, both real and pretend. Swings sat still and slides were lonely. Bells didn't ring and halls were empty. We had birthdays without parties, shared words without sounds, and reached each other without touching. The world was changing a tiny bit outside. Inside we waited, we lay, laughed, and we worried, and we cried, and we tried to breathe. We made things together and did things alone. We hoped and prayed and wished. We were all changing a tiny bit inside. Outside, the world kept growing. Inside, we kept growing too. So why did we all go inside? Well, there were a lot of reasons, but mostly because everyone knew it was the right thing to do. On the outside, we were all different. But on the inside, we were all the same. And we remembered that soon spring would come inside and outside. I um, am reading red, white, some passages out of Red, White, and Whole. It's by Rajani LaRocca, and she's actually a collegiate alumni. And this book is written in verse, so it reads like a poem. Two. I have two lives, one that is Indian, one that is not. I have two best friends, one who is Indian, one who is not. At school, I swim in a river of white skin and blonde hair and brown hair and blue eyes and green eyes and hazel school subjects and giggles about boys, salad and sandwiches. And on weekends, I float in a sea of brown skin and black hair and dark eyes, MTV music videos and giggles about boys, samosas and subjis. In both places, I have gossip and laughter, music and silence, friendship, but only in one place do I have my parents. Bindi, I am seven years old. It is Ama's second week at work in a lab at the hospital. She puts a small red sticker, a circular Bindi on her forehead, then takes it off. She puts on a smaller Bindi, a black one, then takes that off too. She takes an eyebrow pencil and draws the tiniest black dot. What are you doing? I ask. She looks at me in the mirror. Last week, so many people asked me about my bindi. Why? I ask. Because they haven't seen one. Why? Because they aren't that many people here who are Hindu. Why? Because we come from another country where your aunties and uncles and cousins live. My supervisor asked me to stop wearing my bindi so my coworkers and our patients aren't uncomfortable. Does that make you sad? Yes, Kana. Ama sighs, takes a tissue, wipes off the dot. Do you speak Indian? 
At the end of French class, Tiffany comments that I'm so good at languages, English, French, and do you speak Indian? So many things float through my mind as I watch her twist a straight, silky lock blonde hair around her finger. I want to tell her that people from India, just the small sample of Indian people in her own city, speak over a dozen languages. We are Hindu, Muslim, Christian, and other religions. We're all different shades, from dark brown to almost pale as she is. I want to tell her we make more kinds of delicious food than she should could imagine. I want to tell her despite our differences, we have so much in common trying to make our lives here. I want to try to tell her I never studied Tamil or Kannada, the languages my parents speak, never learned to conjugate those verbs, never learned those curly alphabets. My parents only talk to me in English. I want to tell her when I reach for words in Kannada or Tamil, all my brain can come up with is the French I learn in school. And what I understand of the languages my parents speak is confined to the mundane conversations of home. And when I do try to talk, my accent is wrong, wronger than my parents' accents when they speak English. But I don't tell her any of this. Instead, I just say no. Here and there. My friends at school have relatives they get to see all the time. Even when they need to travel, it's usually a drive or a short flight away. They celebrate birthdays with cousins, have large family gatherings at Thanksgiving and Christmas. For the three of us to see our family, we need to fly from our town to New York, New York to London, London to Bombay with a stop in Kuwait to refuel. In Bombay, we change from the international airport to the domestic one in a bus full of strangers. In the middle of the night, we drive through the dark city and I can't understand what anyone is saying because they speak Hindi and I don't. We finally board our plane to Bangalore in the very early morning and relief washes over me. As I sit surrounded by people speaking a language, I can finally understand. Every single one of our relatives comes to the airport to greet us like celebrities. My grandparents, uncles and aunties and all my cousins, and I know I've come home. But outside my family smiles and hugs and shy questions, their chatter and laughter and so, so much food, the rest of the city is full of people who stare, who know I'm different, not just because of how I dress, but because of how I talk and walk and breathe. No matter where I go, America or India, I don't quite fit. Thank you. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, thanks. <laughs> so I'll be reading Thank You, Amu. And Amu actually means queen in Nigerian. And the author, she's talking about her grandmother. So thank you, Amu. Hopefully you all can see this in the classroom. On the corner of First Street and Long Street, and on the very top floor, Amu was cooking a thick red stew in a big fat pot for a nice evening meal. She seasoned and stirred it and took a small taste. What a delicious stew, Amu said. Tonight's dinner will surely be the best I have ever had. With that, Amu put down her spoon and went to read a book before supper. As the thick red stew simmered on the stove, its scrumptious scent wafted out the window and out the door, down the hall, toward the street, and around the block until knock 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 someone was at the door when amu opened it she saw a little boy little boy amu exclaimed what brings you to my house i was playing with my race car down the hall when i smelled the most delicious smell the little boy replied what is it thick red stew mmm stew he sighed that sure sounds yummy amu thought for a moment she was saving her stew for dinner but she had made quite a bit it would not hurt to share. Would you like some? The little boy nodded. And so Amu spooned out some thick red stew from the big fat pot for her nice evening meal. Thank you, Amu, the little boy said and went on his way. With that, Amu closed the door and went back to her book. As she read, her thick red stew scrumptious scent wafted out the window and out the door, down the hall, toward the street and around the block until 
knock, knock. Someone was at the door. When Amu opened the door, this time she saw a police officer. Miss police officer, Amu exclaimed, what brings you to my home? I was on duty down the street when I smelled the most delicious smell, Miss police officer replied. What is it? Thick red stew. Ah, stew, she said, and her mouth watered. That sounds mighty tasty. Amu thought for a moment, there was still enough to share. Would you like some? The police officer nodded. Once again, Amu spooned out some thick red stew from the big fat pot for her nice evening meal. Thank you, Amu, the officer said, and went on her way. And so for the second time, Amu closed the door and went back to her book. Sure enough, as she read, her thick red stew scrumptious scent wafted out the window and out the door, down the hall, toward the street, and around the block until, knock, 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 again, someone was at Amu's door. This time when she opened it, she saw a hot dog vendor. Mr. Hot Dog Vendor, Amu exclaimed, what brings you to my home? I was selling my hot dogs down the block when I smelled the most delicious smell, Mr. Hot Dog Vendor replied. What is it? Thick red stew. Ooh, stew. The vendor licked his lips. That sounds quite delectable. So Amu spooned out some thick red stew from the big fat pot for her nice evening meal. Thank you, Amu, the hot dog vendor said and went on his way. Throughout the day, people from all across the neighborhood knocked on Amu's door. She fed a shop owner, a cab driver, a doctor, an actor, a lawyer, a dancer, a baker, an artist, a singer, an athlete, a bus driver, a construction worker, even the mayor stopped by. And each time they knocked, Amu shared. Soon the sky darkened, the street lights brightened, and it was finally time for dinner. But when Amu opened her big fat pot of thick red stew for her nice evening meal, it was empty. Amu sniffled. There goes the best dinner I ever had. Sorry and blue, she sat at the table with her empty pot until knock, 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 knock. Who could that be, Amu wondered. When she opened her door, she saw the little boy the police officer, the hot dog vendor, the shop owner, the cab driver, the doctor, the actor, the lawyer, the dancer, the baker, why everyone she fed today was at her door. I'm sorry, everyone, Amu sighed. My thick red stew is all gone. I have nothing left to share. The little boy tugged at Amu's sleeve. Don't worry, Amu. We're not here to ask. We are here to give. The police officer carried in a fresh salad. The mayor entered with a roast chicken. The baker brought a collection of sweet goodies. Even the little boy presented Amu with something special in a shiny red envelope. Everyone who had knocked on Amu's door that day squeezed into her tiny apartment and together they ate, danced, and celebrated. While Amu's big fat pot of thick red stew was empty, her heart was full of happiness and love. That dinner was the best she ever had. Thank you, Amu. The end, my friends. Hi, my name is uh, Max Selby, and I'm reading a poem from the book, The Red Pencil. Uh, that's a story about a su Sudanese refugees who flee the Janjaweed militia and find shelter in a refugee camp. Walking, walking water. We rise before the sun pierces the night, before dawn has a chance to press on our heads, baking us with unrelenting heat. Mama roses, rouses me, sounding as crisp as rind. Amira, come. Does my mother, mother ever sleep? We wake to walk, many miles there, many back. Taking so long this journey, slowly we go for water. Our plastic jugs are empty on our way. 
to the river's gate. But ach, the return, ach, the ache. In our backs, through our legs, the riverbed fills our empty, wanting vessels with the wet, sloshing promise of water. Weighing heavily, pulling down our pails, down, down, down. Bending branches into arcs that make the ache stay all day. Hi, I'm Georgia, and I'm going to be reading Nappy Hair by Joe Cepeda. Uncle Mordecai told this story at the backyard picnic. Uncle Mordecai told it. The folks joined in between the lines. Little Jimmy taped it, and here it is. Brenda. You sure do got some nappy hair on your head, don't you? Well, it's your hair, Brenda. Take the cake. Yep. And come back and get the plate, don't you know? It ain't easy to come by that kind of hair. No, it ain't. You just can't blame Africa. It's willful. That's what it is. Them some willful, intentional naps you got all over your head. Sure enough. Your hair intended to be nappy. Indeed it did. I mean, combing your hair, yep, is like scrunching through the New Mexico desert in Brogans in the heat of summer. That's the way. It's like crunching through snow. Yep, about a foot, two feet at least. Uh-huh, with two inches of crust on the top. I can hear it. Y'all know how it sounds when you scrunch in through snow like that. I can hear it. That's what her hair sounds like when she comb it out in the morning. Brother, you ought to be ashamed. Ashamed? I'm not ashamed. I'm proud. She's the only one in her school who knows how to talk right. Ain't she something? A rose among a thousand thorns. I know it. Then old hardheads think they can talk English. Yep. But this child talks the king's English. I hear her. Talks the queen's English too. She can do it, but she sure, Lord, got some nappy hair on her head. Now, why's he got to come back to that? And I'm going to tell y'all how she came with all this nappy hair. Brother, will you stop? Her hair was an act of God. Lord, listen to him now. An act of God that came straight through Africa. Well, you see the angels went up to God. Oh, here he goes. Angels walk up to God to talk him out of it. Will you listen to this? Yep, they say, Lord, Lord, Lord. Well, why you gotta be so mean? Why you gotta be so willful? Why you gotta talk? Why you gotta be so ornery? Thinking about giving that nappy, nappy hair to that innocent little child. Innocent. Sweet little girl like that. And you napping up her hair like you ain't got good sense. That's what they said. Napping up her hair, five, six, seven, maybe eight complete circles per inch. Brother, I'm talking eight complete circles per inch of hair. And the angel's trying to talk him out of it. Yep, but God, God wanted himself some nappy hair upon the face of the earth. That's what it was. So God turned himself around, looked them angels square in the face. Well, and God say, get out of my way. This is my world. This is my world. And this child, this sweet little brown baby girl child, we hear you. She's going to have the nappiest hair in the world. That's what he said. Ain't going to be nothing they come up with going to straighten this child's hair. I'm talking about straightening combs. I'm talking about relaxers and processes. Ain't nothing going to straighten up the naps out of this child's head. And it was done. Ha. So here she come, well, sitting back in Africa, making plans, squinching her eyes and looking deep. She was deep, getting ready to come to America with them slaves. Didn't we come over here? Sold your mama for a nickel. Yes, Lord, they did it. And your daddy for a dime. Yep, 
I say they sold your mama for a buffalo. That's the way it was. And your daddy, they sold him for one thim dime. One thim dime. That's what they did. But this nap come riding express, coming on across the ocean from Africa, wouldn't stop for nothing. Didn't she come? Danced right on through all the wimp hair. Didn't want it. Wouldn't stop, wouldn't mix, wouldn't slow down for nobody. Wouldn't do it. Every time they tried to mess with her hair, I can see it. She stomped it, kicked it, snuck, snuck it around, and came on through. That's what she did. Think she playing football, basketball, or something. Dribbling down the line. She's the one. And when she was born, we remember. When we looked at her down in the cradle, what did we see? We all shout and jump back. Did we jump? Laugh and shout because I tell you, she had the kinkiest, the nappiest, the fuzziest, most screwed up, squeezed up, knotted up, tangled up, twisted up, nappiest. I'm telling you, she had the nappiest hair you've ever seen in your life. That's what it was. And the Lord, well, the Lord in heaven, what you say? The Lord brought the Israelites out of Egypt. Yes, he did. He looked down on this cute little brown baby girl. He looked at her, he looked at her, and he said, well done. He say, I got me one. That's what he said. One nap of her hair is the only perfect circle in nature. Well, I got me a cute little brown baby girl. Keep talking. I got me a long, at long last this cute little brown baby girl. Well, and she got the nappiest hair in the world. Ain't it the truth? I'm Ainsley, and I'm going to be reading For a Poet by County Cullen. I have wrapped my dreams in a silken cloth and laid them away in a box of gold. Where long will cling the lips of the moth, I have wrapped my dreams in a silken cloth. I hide no hate, I'm not even wroth. Who found earth's breath so, ke so keen and cold, I have wrapped my dreams in a silken cloth and laid them away in a box of gold. Thank you. I'm Charlotte Doniger, and I'm going to be reading Windows by Julia Dennis. At the end of the day, before the town goes to sleep, you can look out your window and see more little windows light up, lit up, your, lit up like eyes in the dusk, blinking awake as the lights turn on inside a neighborhood of paper lanterns. You can take a walk out your door into the almost night. You might pass a cat or an early raccoon uh, taking a bath in squares of yellow light. One window might be tall with the curtains drawn or small with a party inside. Between two windows, there could be a phone used for good ideas. There might be a hug or a piano and someone might be learning to dance. Another window could be dark with a sleeping plant or two, or maybe bright and rounded like the moon. Some windows still, some windows will have dinner or TV. Others are empty and leave you to fill them up with stories. Then you arrive home again and look out, look out your window from the outside. Someone you love is waving at you and you can't wait to go in. So you do. The end. Hi, I'm Lucy, and I am going to read No Hamsters Here by Nikki Grimes. Son, it is all too easy to let this world's bullies puncture your pride, set you on a wild goose chase of doing whatever crazy thing it takes to show them. Don't be a hamster on that wheel. We real men know it is only an exercise in futility. 
Shake off any insults. Exercise your unique talents to learn, grow, be your best. Not to prove anything to anyone, though that may well be an added benefit. Life is an art, son, not an exhibition. I'm Zacharia, and I'll be reading a poem from The Red Pencil, which is a story about Sudanese refugees who flee the Janjaweed militia and find shelter in a refugee camp. With my pencil, I turn trash bags into pretty petaled blossoms, stemming from fences adorned with sparrow scrollwork. Ruby ornaments decorate my yellow tablets' blue line fences. Good. I'm Riley, and I'm going to be reading Rain School. In the country of Chad, it is the first day of school. The dry dirt road is filling up with children. Big brothers and big sisters are leading the way. Will they give us a notebook? Thomas asks. Will they give us a pencil? Will I learn to read like you? Stop asking so many questions and keep up, say the big brothers and sisters. Thomas arrives at the schoolyard, but there are no classrooms. There are no desks. It doesn't matter. There is a teacher. We will build our own school, she says. This is the first lesson. Thomas learns to make mud bricks and dry them in the sun. He learns to build mud walls and mud desks. He gathers grass and saplings with the other children, and they make a roof. Inside, it is cool. It smells of the earth. It smells of the fields ready for planting. Thomas helps bring the little wooden stools. Everyone sits down. This is the moment they have been waiting for. The teacher brings in the blackboard. Uh, on it, she writes a letter. A, she says. A, says, says Thomas and the other children. The teacher writes the letter in big, with big strokes in the air. The students do the same over and over. Wonderful, says the teacher. She hands out notebooks and pencils. One page, says the teacher. Thomas opens his notebook to the first page and holds his pencil ready and waiting. Now, write the letter A. Beautiful, says the teacher as she looks at the student's work. Every day, Thomas learns something new. Every day, the teacher cheers, cheers him and the other children on. Excellent job, she says. Perfect, my learning, my learning friends. The nine, the nine months of the school year fly by. The last day has come. The students' minds are fat with knowledge. Their notebooks are rumpled from the learning. Thomas and the other children call out, thank you, teacher. She smiles and says, well done, my hardworking friends. See you next year. Thomas and the other children race home. The school is empty, and just in time, the big rains have started. The drops come down hard and fast. Strong winds tear at the grass roof. The rain finds its way inside. The school's mud walls are soaked and start to slump. The mud desks, too. Slowly, the school disappears until there is almost nothing left. It doesn't matter. The letters have all been learned and the knowledge taken away by the children. Come September, school will start over. Thomas, Thomas will be a big brother then, leading the children on their way to, on their first day of school, on their first day to school. They will all stand in front of their smiling teacher, ready to build their school again. That's it.
Um, I'm Lily, and I'm going to be reading Dreamers by Yuri Morales. I dream of you, then you appeared. Together we became <laughs> resplendent life, you and I. One day we bundled gifts in our backpacks and crossed a bridge outstretched like the universe. And when we made it to the other side, thirsty and awe, unable to go back, we became immigrants. Migrant, migrant, migrantees, you and I. The sky and the land welcomed us in the words unlike those of our ancestors. There were so many things we didn't know, unable to understand and afraid to speak. We made lots of mistakes. You and I became camp, caminants. Mm, thousands and thousands of steps we took around this land until the day we found a place we had never seen before. Suspicious, improbable, improbable, unbelievable, surprising, unimaginable. Where we didn't need to speak, we only needed to trust. And we did. Books became our language. Books became our home. Books became our lives. We learned to read, to speak, to write, and to make our voices heard. We are stories. We are two languages. We are lucha. We are resilience. We are hope. We are dreamers, sonadores of the world. We are, oh, we are love. The end. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Relish, and I'm going to be reading The Hill We Climb by Amanda Gordon. Um, read by the poet at the inauguration of President Joe Biden, January 20th, 2021. Mr. President and Dr. Biden, Madam Vice President and Mr. Imhoff, Americans and the world. When the day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. And the norms and notions of just what is, isn't always justice. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country in time, where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself residing for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine. But this doesn't mean we're striving to form a union that is perfect. We are stri striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but to what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first, we must put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so that we can reach our arms out to one another. We seek no harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we tried. They will forever be tied together, victorious. Not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory, 
won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise, Gawade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it. Because being Americans is more than the pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how to repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it, would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith, we trust. For while we have our own eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared it at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour. But within it, we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe, now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be. A country that is bruised but whole, benevolent but bold, fierce and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know that our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens, but one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left. With every breath from our bronze pounded chests, we will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold line limbed hills of the west, and we will rise from the wind swept northeast, where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rim cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked south. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner of our called our country. Our people, diverse and dutiful, will emerge, battered but beautiful. When the day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. A new dawn booms as we fear it, as we free it. For there is always light, if we're only brave enough to see it, if we're only brave enough to be it. Possibly. Oh man, I'm thinking of my senior speech right now. Okay. Um, this is my original poem, Jules McGuire. Forgot to say that. Um, I have titled it "Diversity is Messy." The thing about diversity that many don't understand is that to be diverse is to be difficult, to be stubborn. It is to speak up when no one asks you to ask too many questions about the vast variability within the human experience, to constantly ask yourself, where are my people? To be vulnerable when no one else is able. To be, vi to be diverse is to be messy. Society doesn't like messy. Messy is confusing and hard to understand. But without messy, how does one grow? Well, when society demands a cookie cutter human being, there is no room to grow, no room to flourish, no room to discover, no room to appreciate the differences that make you, you. No room to think, just do. Being the friend that's constantly talking about change for the better isn't always easy. I invite friends to come with me to protests and rallies, but they don't realize that the fight doesn't end for me when I go home. It's every day, morning, evening, night, big events, small events, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and speaking to an audience. Every second I can, I try to push back. So what do we do when society wants a cookie? We give them a mess. The mess we have fought to love and appreciate all the same. A weird, awkward, angry, complicated, beautiful, globby cookie dough mess because it's our mess. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Sophia Luisa. I'm a junior. 
and I will be reading an original poem. Saturday afternoons at my grandma's house. Abuelo sitting on the couch. Colombian soccer game, three to four. He says hi and lets me try the fresh squeezed orange juice he made. I take a taste. All homemade, made to make my bones strong. Nothing processed. He moves on. Cafecito, mi cielo. No thanks. Where's the queso? Arepas and tapas, sopa con papas. No one can stop us when we're in the kitchen. Abuelo with me, living history. I already know what to do. I peel potatoes. She starts a broth for soup. She never wastes because everything is a blessing. Everything is a gift. The plantains, the chicken, the cornmeal you sift. We work for hours talking in between. Tell me about your life in your American dream. She tells me she arrived in the year 1963. A suitcase, a visa, and a pale pink rosary. All she really needed, she says, was her faith in God and a high held head. Started in a factory, her English wasn't perfect. The mean men made her nervous, a, bo a book of English so she could learn it. She did and flipped 180, working long days to get ahead. Strong mind that led her to the steps of the Bank of New York. The streets as they roared would stop to listen as she made history. First Latina in her division, she smiles with pride for a second then asks me to check if the chicken is done. Always working for everyone else. Never a moment for herself, matriarch of my mother's side, always there to give me a ride to school or sports or home. And of course, I always forget to tell her the most important part. Thank you. Thank you, Abuelita, for every meal you bring, for every poem that you read, for encouraging me to write, to set my, to set my sights high, but keep my feet down, stay grounded. Thank you for reminding me not to worry. Life is never a hurry. It is a steady pace. Thank you for teaching me your recipes and all your little tricks, for handing me the spoon and allowing me to mix. Thank you for inviting me over on Saturday afternoons to cook and to eat and to spend time with you. Thank you the most for being my Ita, for sharing your culture and a bowl of sopita. Thank you. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to Mrs. Franks, to all of my colleagues who are making this special day happen. I am particularly happy to actually recite the poems for you because um, poetry has always been special to me. And I believe the voice of poets is such that you have to take a deep breath, ground yourself, be in the moment, and go with the flow. This poem is from New Caledonia. The poet, Wanir Wulapane, invites you to explore the different languages spoken by a number of people in his native land, New Caledonia. It is a dance that celebrates the brotherhood of man. I will not be dancing for you. <laughs> Focus on my intonation rather than the words that are coming out of my mouth. Nous dansons la danse de la terre. Ningone dehu iaye fagayuga uvaye de tout vos forces. Venez chanter. Dansez à la face du monde pour que le monde apprécie notre danse de la terre. Langue de la terre. Des îles Luate, Langue de la terre de Momaïwe, Langue de la terre du monde entier. Criez! Chantez, louez l'esprit dans le vent et dansons la danse de la terre. The second, the second poem that I'm going to share with you is one that is really special to me. Um, if I can pull it up here. <clears throat> it's one that I actually 
used very recently with my French Five students. It's a Léon de Ma, de a, -M -A poem, and it's called Guyane. This one is completely in French. You will now hear me read the introduction. The poem is called Savoir Vivre, in other words, to know how to live. And this poem is special to me because we all have to be a little bit of a bon vivant, a person who lives life to his fullest. The poet prefers to yawn the African way with his hand on his heart to the French way with his hand on his mouth. On ne baille pas chez moi. Comme il baille chez eux. Avec la main sur la bouche. Je veux bailler sans tralalas. Le corps. Recroquevillé. Dans les parfums qui tourmentent la vie. Que je me suis faite de leur museau. De chien d'hiver. De leur soleil qui me pourrait pas même t'y dire. L'eau de coco qui faisait glou glou dans mon ventre au réveil. Laissez-moi bailler la main là, mais sur le cœur. À l'obsession de tout ce qui est à quoi j'ai eu un jour un seul tourner le dos. Thank you very much and have a great afternoon. I'm so glad I was here. Thank you. This poem is on the pulse of the morning. It was read by Maya Angelou for the inauguration of Bill Clinton in 1992. A rock, a river, a tree. Host to species long since departed, marked the mastodon. The dinosaur who left dried tokens of their sojourn here. On our planet floor, any broad alarm of their hastening doom is lost in the gloom of dust and ages. But today the rock cries out to us, clearly, forcefully. Come, you may stand upon my back and face your distant destiny, but seek no haven in my shadow. I will give you no hiding place down here. You, created only a little lower than the angels, have crouched too long in the bruising darkness have lain too long face down in ignorance, your mouths spilling words, armed for slaughter. The rock cries out to us today, you may stand upon me, but do not hide your face. Across the wall of the world, a river sings a beautiful song. It says, come, rest here by my side. Each of you a bordered country, delicate and strangely made proud, yet thrusting perpetually under siege. Your armed struggles for profit have left collars of waste upon my shore, currents of debris upon my breast. Yet today I call you to my riverside, if you will study war no more. Come, clad in peace, and I will sing the songs the Creator gave to me when I and the tree and the rock were one. Before cynicism was our bloody sear across your brow, and when you yet knew, you still knew nothing. The river sang and sings on. There is a true yearning to respond to the singing river and the wise rock. So say the Asian, the Hispanic, the Jew, the African, the Native American, the Sioux, the Catholic, the Muslim, the French, the Greek, 
the Irish, the rabbi, the priest, the sheik, the gay, the straight, the preacher, the privileged, the homeless, the teacher. They hear the first and last of every tree, speak to humankind today. Come to me here beside the river, plant yourself beside the river. Each of you descendant of some passed on traveler has been paid for. You who gave me my first name, you Pawnee, Apache, Seneca, you Cherokee nation who rested with me, then forced on bloody feet, left me to the employment of other seekers desperate for gain, starving for gold. You, the Turk, the Arab, the Swede, the German, the Eskimo, the Scot. You, the Ashanti, the Aruba, the crew, bought, sold, stolen, arriving on a nightmare, praying for a dream. Here, root yourselves beside me. I am that tree planted by the river, which will not be moved. I, the rock, I, the river, I, the tree, I am yours. Your passages have been paid. Lift up your faces. You have a piercing need for this bright morning dawning for you. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, Take it into the palms of your hands, mold it into the shape of your most private need, sculpt it into the image of your most public self. Lift up your hearts. Each new hour, hour holds new chances for a new beginning. Do not be wedded forever to fear, yoked eternally to brutishness. The horizon leans forward, offering, offering you space to place new steps of change. Here on the pulse of this fine day, you may have the courage to look up and out and upon me, the rock, the river, the tree, your country, no less than Midas to the mendicant, no less to you now than the mastodon then. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face, your country, and say simply, very simply, with hope, Good morning. Hi, I'm Lily. I'm gonna be reading a poem called Tus Manos. Cuando tus manos salen, amor hacia las mías, que me traen volando, por qué se detuvieron? En mi boca de pronto, ¿por qué los reconozco? Como si entonces antes la hubiera tocado. Como si antes de ser hubieron recorrido mi frente, mi cintura. Su suavidad viene, volado sobre el tiempo, sobre el mar, sobre el humo, sobre la primavera y cuando tú pusiste. Tus manos en mi pecho, reconoció esas alas de paloma dorado. Reconocí es, es sagrada y ese color de trigo. Los años de mi vida yo cam, caminé buscándolas. Subí las escaleras, crucé los arferices. Me llevaron dos trenes, las aguas de mi trajeron. Y en el, la piel de las uvas me uh, pareció tocarte. La mad, madera de pronto me trajo en tu contacto. La almerada me anunciaba tu suavidad secreta hasta que será un tus manos en mi pecho y allí como tus alas terminaron su viaje. going one of my favorite books and this is my favorite passage it's like a page okay they walked to the beach old lady moved so slowly it was like she wasn't moving at all neither of them wore shoes and when they got to the edge of the sand they waited for the water to come up and lick the spaces between their toes clean the sand that was hidden there 
Marjorie watched as her grandmother closed her eyes and she waited patiently for the old woman to speak. It was what they'd come for, what they'd always come for. Are you wearing this stone? Her grandmother asked. Instinctively, Marjorie raised her hand to her necklace. Her father had given it to her only a year before, saying it was finally old enough to care for it. It had belonged to Old Lady and then to Abna before her, and to James and Quay and Effia the Beauty before that. It had begun with Mame, the woman who set the great fire. Her father had told her that the necklace was a part of their family history, and she was to never take it off, never give it away. Now it reflected the ocean water before them, gold waves shimmering in the black stone. Yes, old lady, she said. Her grandmother took her hand, and once more they fell silent. You are in this water, she finally said. Marjorie nodded her head soberly. The day she was born, 13 years ago, all the way across the Atlantic, her parents had mailed her an umbilical cord to the old lady so the woman could put it into the ocean. It was old lady's only request that if her son and daughter-in-law both old themselves by the time they decided to get married and move to America, ever had a child that they would send something of that child back to Ghana. Our family began here in Cape Coast, old lady said. She pointed to the Cape Coast castle. In my dreams, I kept seeing this castle, but I did not know why. One day I came to see these waters and I could feel the spirits of our ancestors calling to me. Some were fury and they spoke to me from the sand, but others were trapped deep, deep, deep in the water so that I had to wade out to hear their voices. I waded out so far the water almost took me down to meet those spirits that were trapped so deep in the sea that they would never be free. When they were living, they had not known where they came from and so dead they did not know how to get to dry land. I put you in here so that if your spirit ever wandered, you would know where home was. Marjorie nodded as her grandmother took her hand and walked her farther and farther out in the water. It was their summer ritual, her grandmother reminding her how to come home. So I'm Harris, um, and this passage is from King and the Dragonflies about a boy who's struggling after his brother dies and a good friend of his disappears. This is a passage of him remembering his brother. Some nights when I can't sleep, I just sit up in bed, staring at the time passing by on my phone until I get fed up with trying to sleep when sleep is definitely not coming. I get up and slip my hand under the mattress for my journal. I skip all the notes about ev evolution, skim over the pages to see if Khalid had given me a clue about where I can find him. Time's all one, he told me that more than once. Fast asleep, eyes fluttering beneath their lids as he dreamed. No such thing, time's all one. Took me, a long, took me a long time to puzzle out what that could mean. Until one morning, while we were eating cereal, he told me that, sometimes, he thinks there isn't such a thing as time. That everything's happening all at once, from the first bang that started the universe to the very moment that everything comes to an end. That's a lot to be happening all at once. An explosion, an expansion of stars, and galaxies and planets and suns, our little planet with all our little lives. And then everything turning to dust until nothing in this universe exists anymore at all. That's a whole lot to be happening right now, at this very moment. Bahalid just shrugged his shoulders. Why not? If he's right and everything's happening all at once, then maybe even while he was still alive, he would dream of the future. Maybe he knew I'd be looking for him. Maybe one night he told me where I could find him. And once he became a dragonfly and I didn't even realize it. Maybe all that means he's still alive, even now. Khalid, alive right now, even as he's beneath the ground, alive as he sleeps and dreams, alive as he gives me that crooked grin and puts his hand in my hair, alive as he says, love you, bro like it's our little joke, alive as that pain in my chest expands like its own little universe.
Very spontaneous, you could say. Okay, um, so this is at a part where a um, police officer um, just shot uh, an unarmed black man. And so this is kind of uh, the eulogy at his funeral. Very well, so I'll tell you. His name is Clifton and he was young and he was a leader. And where he fell, there was a hole in the heel of his sock and when he stretched forward, he seemed not as tall as when he stood. So he died, and we who loved him are gathered here to mourn him. It's as simple as that and as short as that. His name was Clifton, and he was black, and they shot him. Isn't that enough to tell? Isn't that all you need to know? Isn't that enough to appease your thirst for drama and send you home to sleep it off? Go take a drink and forget it, or read it in the daily news. His name was Clifton, and they shot him. And I was there to see him fall. So I know it as I know it. Here are the facts. He was standing and he fell. He fell and he kneeled. He kneeled and he bled. He bled and he died. He fell in a heap like any man and his blood spilled out like any blood. Red as any blood, wet as any blood and reflecting the sky and the buildings and the birds and the trees or your face if you looked into its doling mirror. And it dried in the sun as blood dries. That's all. They spilled his blood and he bled. They cut him down and he died. The blood flowed on the walk in a pool, gleamed a while and after a while became dull, then dusty, then dried. That's the story and that's how it ended. It's an old story and there's been too much blood to excite you. Besides, it's only important when it fills the veins of any living man. Aren't you tired of such stories? Aren't you sick of the blood? Then why listen? Why don't you go? It's hot out here. There's an odor of the embalming fluid. The beer is cold in the taverns. The saxophones will be mellow at the Savoy. Uh, plenty of good lies will be told at the barber shops and beauty, beauty parlors. And there'll be sermons in 200 churches in the cool evening and plenty of laughs at the movies. Go listen to Amos and Andy and forget it. Here, you have only the same old story. There's not even a young wife up here in red to mourn him. There's nothing here to pity, no one to break down and shout, nothing to give you the good old frightening feeling. The story's too short and too simple. His name is Clifton, Todd Clifton. He was unarmed and his death was as senseless as his life was futile. He had struggled for the brotherhood on a hundred secret corners, street corners, and he thought it would make him more human, but he died like any dog in the road. Um, I'm reading the book. Yeah, I'm reading the book, uh, Meet the Lot Keys. It's about uh, the Hanukkah story. I thought it would be appropriate because Hanukkah's coming up. Um, Meet the Lot Key family. They're just like you and me, except they're potato pancakes. That's Lucy Lotkey and her dog, Applesauce. Mama and Papa are busy in the kitchen making fried jelly donuts. Lucy's older brother, Lex, is reading comic books. Get out of my room, he shouts. Lex is a teenager. He doesn't care about anything. But Lex should care because tonight's the night, Lucy sings. It's the first night of Hanukkah. Oh, right. There's someone else in the Lockie family. Grandpa, tonight's not Hanukkah, Grandpa says. It's Hanukkah. That's what I said. Lucy is confused. Hanukkah. Grandpa grumbles. Say it with me. Hanukkah. Actually, both Hanukkah and Hanukkah are right. The holiday's name is Hebrew, so there are different ways to spell it and say it in English. Thanks, applesauce, says Lucy. Oomph, says Grandpa.
Getting ready for Hanukkah. The Lotke family cooks and sings and decorates the house. Except for Lex. He still doesn't care about anything. Then, after the menorah is lit and the dreidels are spun and the gelt gets gobbled, Grandpa pops Lucy onto his lap. Do you want to hear about the miracle of Hanukkah, my little Lotke? I do, Lucy says, biting into her last chocolate coin. Grandpa begins with just a whisper. First, you need to know about the bees. Bees, Lucy asks. Grandpa nods. Hanukkah is a, is a celebration of how the Jewish temple was saved from destruction. We celebrate this holiday thanks to the brave bees who buzzed and stung and fought to keep our people safe. I'm pretty sure there aren't any bees in the history of Hanukkah or Hanukkah. Feh, says Grandpa. Whose story is that? Lucy's eyes widen. Were the bees big, Grandpa? Big? They were huge, giant. They were mega bees. You mean Maccabees? Nope, Grandpa says. Definitely mega bees. And the biggest, bravest bee of them all was Judah Megabee. Judah Maccabee. He was a mighty warrior and heroic Jew who, who lived in Israel more than 2,000 years ago, and there were no bees. But Lucy can see it now. Judah and his swarm of giant bees, buzzing and stinging and fighting to save the Jewish temple and the lives of everyone who worshipped there. And who do you think Judah and his big bees were battling, Grandpa asks. That's easy. It was... Alien potatoes from planet... <sighs> Grandpa booms. <laughs> no, yes, this is ridiculous. Zip, zap, zoawi, Grandpa continues. Outer space spuds invaded Earth. Lasers shot from their eyes, and they had a lot of eyes. Everyone was doomed. Are you kidding me? The alien, the, the enemy wasn't a bunch of alien potatoes. It was a terrible king named Antiochus. Antiochus demanded that everyone believe in the same religion as he did. Applesauce goes on. So for the Jews, that meant no more studying Torah, no more celebrating Shabbat, and never again worship God. King Antiochus and his followers almost completely destroyed the Jewish temple. He was a tyrant. Yes, a tyrant, agrees Grandpa. Judah and the Megabees were trapped by those evil tater tyrants from planet Ch. Prisoners in their own hive, they, they had only enough to last one day. Running out of honey? No, they were running out of oil. They needed oil to keep the temple's eternal flame burning. And they weren't bees. Shh, says Grandpa. The mega bees plotted and schemed, Grandpa says. And the next morning, when the sun rose on the temple, an enormous wooden dreidel stood in the village square. What could it be? The alien potatoes all wondered. And why does it buzz? Lucy waves her arms. I know, the mega bees were hiding inside the dreidel. Smart Locky, cries Grandpa. Plits, plats, plots, the mega bees burst from the dreidel and sliced and whipped and mashed those tater tyrants into taters. Tater tyrant, tater, tater tyrants, Lucy asks. Try saying that three times fast, Grandpa says. And then, miracle of miracles, Grandpa says. Judah Megabee stood in the middle of all those spoiled spuds. What a waste, he said. And so that great warrior added some egg and onion and a pinch of flour to make something good from the bad. Potato latkes. Us? Us. Boy. Lucy's eyes and mouth open, are open wide. So the miracle of Hanukkah is that a long time ago, mega bees turned alien potatoes into latkes? Is that really true? Of course it's not true. The miracle of Hanukkah is that not only did the small group of Maccabees protect the temple from King Antiochus's powerful army, but also the tiny bit of oil left to light the holy menorah didn't last for just one day. That oil kept the eternal light bright for eight whole days. 
Lucy points to her family's glowing menorah, eight candle holders, eight days of Hanukkah, eight days of the Hanukkah miracle, and the shamus, the tallest candle to light all the others. You know what, says Grandpa, I like the dog's miracle better. Me too, says Mama. Me too, says Papa. I don't care, says Lex, stuffing his face with chocolate gout. Lex, you left your room, cries Mama. It's another Hanukkah miracle. Hanukkah! Grandpa pats applesauce. Now that we all know the Hanukkah story, he gives a wooden dreidel a little spin. Who wants to hear about Passover? It's a thing. Um, so I do. I need, do I need to stand close to this to, to get picked up? Is that part of it? Yeah, um, all right. So I'm actually going to take my mask off because since I did used to teach lower school, I wanted to pick a children's book, but I'm going to follow it up with um, a piece of my own poetry. So when I was um, about 22, I worked in a publishing house. I worked at Penguin Books in New York City, and I got to meet this writer, and I was crazy about her. I thought she was so cool. And um, then I taught at this elementary school, and I had the opportunity to meet her and her husband. And um, they, I, I was wearing an orange shirt, and my friend was wearing a black shirt. And she was just charming and everything I wanted her to be. And her st super strange designer husband uh, looked at me and looked at my friend and, and said to my friend, you are wearing black. And you are wearing orange. <laughs> So all the more reason for me to pick this, because it's just everything about this person makes me think about that time and love of language and love of story and love of ridiculousness. So this is called Max Makes a Million. I am Max, Max the dreamer, Max the poet, Max the dog. My dream is to live in Paris, to live in Paris and be a poet. Paris, the city of dreams, the city of lights, the city of love. But do you think it is easy for a dog to pack a small brown suitcase, put on a beret, and hop on a plane? Ha! Plane tickets cost money. Mazuma, shekels, simoleons, I have none. Because no one wants to buy my book. I'm flat broke, bone dry. But someday, Fat families and skinny families around the world will be reading my poems and laughing and crying. I feel it in my bones. I want to say before anything that dreams are very important. I live in New York City, that crazy, quivering, wandering, wild city, a city like an enormous orchestra, a bebop city, everyone playing music that screeches and slides into my ears everyone singing a different song everyone running a different way all day all night a jumping jazzy city tall people short people plaid people carrying boxes carrying chairs traffic towers a shimmering simmering triple decker sandwich kind of a city wow new york bow wow wow i live with ida and morris stravinsky in the spacious stravinsky apartment morris had his a lady shoe store Stravinsky shoes. Every day he goes down to his store and shows women different shoes, pumps, sandals, slippers, mules. Morris and his assistant Laura are designing shoes for the Queen of Sheba, who must be a very fussy woman because every time a customer makes Morris crazy, he says, who do you think you are, the Queen of Sheba? <laughs> Meanwhile, across town, Ida is taking tango lessons with Maurice Chagall. He has a big, shiny, shiny pompadour on his head and tiny, shiny, pointy shoes on his feet. Morris and Ida don't have any children, but they have me, Max, and they start to cry every time I bring up the subject of moving to Paris. They will have to face the facts. There is an old Chinese proverb that says parents must give their children two things, roots and wings. I have the roots. Now I want the wings. So if you want any more of Max, there's a couple more of these. 
But the truth is, I, you know, Max in this story does um, win a. Um, can you see my orange glasses? Does win, um, you know, the big prize and gets a million dollars for a book of poems, which could never happen because poets make no money. <laughs> um, and getting a poem published is not an easy task. Um, as I know, I have tried many times. I have had a couple of poems published. Um, this one is out there in the world right now trying to get published, but I thought I would share it with you today just since we're sharing some personal work. So um, this one is, uh, came about when I went down to meet my wife-to-be's family in um, Benton, Kentucky, which is a very tiny, tiny, and rather backwards town. Family weekend in Marshall County. I'd never seen snapping turtle roadkill, if that's what happened. Crash or crawl, either way, the mean old hulking thing baked to leather on the hot shoulder of the turnpike. An omen, I figured. Your family would hate me. Pretty and bright don't matter. Gay don't play in the west end of the state. Avoided handshakes made me eat my butter beans on the porch. Before it got too dark, I was asked to snap the family photo. Me alone in the parched grass. You in a field of Methodists who would never dance at our wedding. But then your brother rode me home, dipped deep into the hairpins, and let me hold tight and scream all I wanted. And I wanted. Waking that night to cuckoo clocks and the green smell of the lake. It could have been midnight or five or another time altogether. You and I hold each other soft breast to soft breast in the morning, hot black coffee and a wax wing perching pretty and bright. Thank you. I'm going to read a poem in French, and then I'm going to read the translation of it. Did you write it? No, no, I did not. This is by uh, René Philom. He is a, a, he's from Cameroon, um, and then he moved to France later on in his life. J'ai frappé à ta porte, j'ai frappé à ton cœur. Pour avoir bon lit, pour avoir bon feu. Pourquoi me repousser? Ouvre-moi, mon frère. Pourquoi me demander si? Si je suis de Afrique, si je suis de Amérique, si je suis de Asie, si je suis de Europe, ouvre-moi, mon frère. Pourquoi me demander la longueur de mon nez, l'épaisseur de ma bouche, la couleur de ma peau et le nom de mes dieux? Ouvre-moi, mon frère. Je ne suis pas un noir, je ne suis pas un rouge, je ne suis pas un jaune, je ne suis pas un blanc, mais je suis qu'un homme. Ouvre-moi, mon frère. Ouvre-moi ta porte, ouvre-moi ton cœur, car je suis un homme, le homme de tout le temps, le homme de tout le ciel, le homme qui te ressemble. And then in English, the title is The Man Who Resembles You. I knocked at your door, I knocked at your heart, so that I may have good bed, so that I may have a warm fire. Why do you refuse me? Let me in, brother. Why do you ask if I'm African, if I'm American, if I'm Asian, if I'm European? Let me in, brother. Why do you ask the length of my nose, the thickness of my mouth, the color of my skin, and the name of my gods? Let me in, brother. I am not black, I am not red, I am not white, but I am only a man. Let me in, brother. Let me in your door, let me into your heart, because I am a man, the man of all times, the man of all the heavens, the man who resembles you.
Okay, I'm reading a, like, kind of an excerpt from Trevor Noah's book, Born a Crime. When I was growing up, we used to get American TV shows rebroadcast on our stations. Doogie Hoser, MD, Murder, She Wrote, Rescue 911 with William Shatner. Most of them were dubbed into African languages. ALF was Afrikaans. Transformers was in Soho, but if Sotho, but if you wanted to watch them in English, the original American audio would be simulacast on the radio. You could mute your TV and listen to that. Watching those shows, I realized that whenever black people were on speaking African languages, they were felt familiar to me. They sounded like they were supposed to sound. Then I listened to them in simulacast on the radio, and they would have all black a American accents. My perception of them changed. They didn't feel familiar. They felt like foreigners. Language brings with it an identity and a culture, or at least the perception of it. A shared language says, we're the same. A language barrier says, we're different. The architects of apartheid understood this. Part of the effort to divide black people was to make sure we separated, not just physically, but by language as well. In the Bantu schools, children were only taught in their home language. Zulu kids learned in Zulu. Tezwana kids learned in Tezwana. Because of this, we'd fall into a trap that the government had set for us and fight among ourselves, believing that we were different. The great thing about language is that you can just as easily use it to do the opposite, convince people that they are the same. Racism teaches us that we are different because of the color of our skin. But because racism is stupid, it's easily tricked. If you're racist and you meet someone who doesn't look like you, the fact that he can't speak like you reinforces your racist pre preconceptions. He's different, less intelligent. A brilliant scientist can come over the border from Mexico to live in America, but if he speaks in broken English, the people say, eh, I don't trust this guy, but he's a scientist. In Mexican science, maybe, I don't trust him. However, if the person who doesn't look like you speaks like you, your brain short circuits because your racism program has none of those instructions in the code. Wait, wait, your mind says, the racism code says if he doesn't look like me, he isn't like me. But the language code says if he speaks like me, he is like me. Something is off here, I can't figure this out. poem that's celebrating links and views. <laughs> On Saturday, my mama sang a song that sounded blue. Then daddy made his trumpet cry. I guess the wrenches do. Round midnight came a band of neighbors swinging soul to soul. The landlord even cut a rug and let the good times roll. They all ate mama's waffles and her chicken cordon bleu. Then daddy passed his hat around because the rent is due. Come Sunday, me and mama kneeled while Deacon Willie prayed. When we got home, my daddy cheered, hooray, the rent is paid. Um, I'm reading three Langston Hughes poems. They relate about the black identity and some of the black struggle in the 1950s, early civil rights movement. The first poem is African American Fragment. So long, so far away is Africa. Not even memories alive, save those that history books create. Save those that songs beat back into the blood, beat out of the blood with words sad sung. In strange, un-Negro tones, so long, so far away is Africa. Subdue and time loss are the drums, and yet through some vast mist of race, there comes this song. I do not understand this song of astivistic land, of bitter yearnings lost without a place. So long, so far away is Africa's dark face. It's, this next poem is Graduation. Cinnamon and rayon, jet and coconut eyes, Mary Lulu Jackson smooths the skirt at her thighs. 
Mama portly oven brings reminders from the kitchen where the people are all icebergs wrapped in checks and wealthy. Diploma in this new frame, Mary Lulu Jackson, eating chicken tells her mama she's a typist and clicking of the keys will spell the name of a job in a fine office far re removed from basic oven, cook, cook stoves and iceberg kitchens. Mama says, praise Jesus, until then I'll bring home chicken. The diploma bursts its frame to scatter stardust in their eyes. Mama says, praise Jesus, the colored race will rise. Mama says, praise Jesus, and then because she's tired, she sighs. The last poem is Stars. Oh, sweep of stars over Harlem Street. Oh, little breath of oblivion, that is night. A, si a city building to a mother's song, a city dreaming to a lullaby. Reach up your hand, dark boy, and take a star out of the breath of, ob of oblivion, that is night. Just take one star. Um, so I'm reading um, an excerpt from the book The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Once upon a time, there was a hazel-eyed boy with dimples. I called him Khalil. The world called him a thug. He lived, but not nearly long enough, and for the rest of my life, I'll remember how he died. Fairy tale? No, but I'm not giving up on a better ending. It would be easy to quit if it was just about me, Khalil, that night, and that cop. It's about way more than that, though. It's about Seven, Sakani, Kenya, Devante. It's about Oscar, Ayana, Trayvon, Rika, Michael, Eric, Tamir, John, Azel, Sandra, Freddie, Alton, Philando. It's even about that little boy in 1955 who nobody recognized at first, Emmett. The messed up part? There's so many more. Yet I think it'll change one day. How, I don't know. When, I definitely don't know. Why, because there will always be someone ready to fight. Maybe it's my turn. Others are fighting too, even in the garden where sometimes it feels like there's not a lot worth fighting for. People are realizing and shouting and marching and demanding. They're not forgetting. I think that's the most important part. Khalil, I'll never forget. I'll never give up. I'll never be quiet, I promise. Um, I'm going to be reading um, a little poem called My River of Dreams by Margarita Engel. Um, and it's about um, the life of a Puerto Rican woman named Julia. Six of my 12 brothers and sisters died of hunger, but my gentle mother took me for long walks beside a river of beautiful dreams. I learned to love nature in the island, even though we were so poor that I had to climb into classroom through a window because we could not afford school tuition. I struggled to become a teacher and a poet so I could use my words to fight for equal rights for women and work towards meetings, um, for, towards meeting the needs of poor children and speak for independence of Puerto Rico. Later, much later, even though I now live in New York, I still remember my childhood's beautiful river of dreams.
Okay, kind of short, but I'm good. Hello? Okay. Can you guys hear me? It's not on. It's just for a show. Oh. 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 <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, that, that's good. Yeah. Okay. I was like, <laughs> Heidi, do you want to go first? Sure. Okay. Okay, so we are reading Persephilis by Mary Jane Satrapi. Satrapi. Okay, right, I'm going to read chapter one. It's called The Veil. This is me when I was 10 years old. This was in 1980. And this is a class photo. I'm sitting on the right on the far left, so you don't see me. From the left to the right, Gonzala Mashadid Nareen Mina. In 1979, a revolution took place. It was later called the Islamic Revolution. Then came 1980, the year it became obli obligatory. obligatory to wear the veil at school. Wear this. We didn't read like, we didn't really like to wear the veil, especially since we didn't understand why we had to. It's too hot out. Exudition in the name of freedom. Oh, I'm the monster of darkness. You'll have to lick my feet. Get, yeah. Give me back my veil. And also became the year before in 1990. 79, we were in a French non-religious school where the boys and girls were together. And then suddenly in 1980, all bilingual. bilingual schools must be closed down. They are symbols of capitalism. Bravo, that wisdom of decadence. This is called cultural revolution. We found ourselves veiled and separated from our friends. And that was that. Everywhere in the streets where were demonstrations for against the veil. Freedom, freedom, the, free the veil. At one of the demonstrations, a German journalist took a photo of my mother. I was really proud of her. Her photo was published in all the European newspapers and even in one magazine in Iran. My mother was really scared. Have you seen this? Don't worry, darling. She dyed her hair and wore dark glasses for a long time. I really didn't know what to think about the veil. Deep down, I was very religious, but as a family, we were very modern and against Avant avant-guard. 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 I was born with religion. At the age of six, I was already sure I was the last prophet. This was a few years before the revolution. Before me, there had been a few others. I'm the last prophet, a woman. I wanted to be a prophet because our maid did not eat with us, because my father had a Cadillac, and above all, because my grandmother's knees always ached. Come here, Marge. Let me, help me stand. Don't worry soon. 
Don't worry. Soon you won't have any pain, you'll see. Only my grandmother knew about my book. Rule number six. Like all my predecessors, I had my holy book. The first three rules came from Zara Ostra. Ostra. He was the first prophet in my country before the Arab invasion. You must base everything on these three rules. Behave well, speak well, act well. I also wanted us to celebrate the tradition Zara Zarahustrian. Zarahustrian holidays, like the fire ceremony. Before the Persian New Year, nor is on March 21st, the first day of spring. Only my grandmother knew about my book. Rule number six, everybody should have a car. Rule number seven, all maids should eat at the table with the others. Rule number eight, no old person should have to suffer. In that case, I'll be your first disciple. Really? But tell me how you'll arrange for old people to not suffer. It will simply be forbidden. Every night I had a big discussion with God. God, give me more time. I'm not quite ready yet. Yes, you are celestial light. You are my choice, my last and my best choice. Except for my grandmother, I was obviously the only one who believed in myself. What do you want to be when you grow up? I'll be a prophet. Ha, ha, ha. She's crazy. My parents were called in by the teacher. Your child is disturbed. She wants to become a prophet. What about it? She does, doesn't this worry you? No, not at all. None? Nonetheless. Nonetheless, my parents were puzzled. So tell me, child, what do you want to be when you grow up? A prophet. I want to be a doctor. That's my love. That's fine. I felt guilty towards God. You don't want to be a doctor. I thought that. No, no, I will be a prophet, but they mustn't know. I want it to be a justice, love, and the wrath of God all in one. My faith was unshakable. The year of the revolution, I had to take action. So I put my prof my prophetic destiny aside for a while. Today, my name is She Guevara. I am Fidel, and I want to be Trotsky. We demonstrated in the garden of our house. Down with the king! Down with the king! The revolution is like a bicycle. When the wheels don't turn, it falls. Well spoken. And so went the revolution in my country. After a long sleep of 2,500 years, the revolution has finally awakened the people. 2,500 years of tyranny and submission, as my father said. First our own emperors, then the Arab invasion from the west, followed by the Mongolian invasion from the east, and finally, modern imperialism. To enlighten me, they bought books. I knew everything about the children of Pal Palestine about Fidel Castro, about the young Vietnamese killed by the Americans, about the revolutionaries of my country. But my favorite was a comic book entitled Dialect Materialism. In my book, you could see Marx and Descartes. The material world doesn't exist. It's only a, re a reflection of our own imagination. Says you, you mean that even though you see the stone in my hand? It doesn't exist since it's only in your imagination? Exactly. Ouch! What are you doing, Carl? You broke my skull. Ha ha ha. It was funny to see how much Marx and God looked alike. Each looked like each other. Though Marx's hair was a bit curlier. Despite everything, God came to see me from time to time. So you don't want to be a prophet anymore? Let's talk about something else. You think I look like Marx? I told you to talk about something else. Tomorrow the weather is going to be nice. It will be 75 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade. Shh, wait a second. They burned down the Rex Cinema tonight. Oh my God. The doors had been locked from the outside a few minutes before the fire. The police were there. They forbade people to rescue those locked inside. Then they attacked them. The firemen didn't arrive until 40 minutes later. The BBC said there were 400 victims, 
The Shah said that a group of religious fanatics perpetrated the massacre, but the people knew that it was the Shah's fault. Tomorrow there will be another demonstration. Obviously, we can't let things like that happen. I want to go too. Don't you think I look like She Guevara? Maybe I'll be even better as Fidel Castro. Where are you? Are you there? I want to come with you tomorrow. Where? To demonstrate on the street. I am sick and tired of going to doing it in the garden. It is very dangerous. They shoot people. For a revolution to succeed, the entire population must support it. You can participate later on. Sure, sure, when it's all over. Mom, please. Oh, no. Come on, you're going to bed now. Please, please, please. God, where are you? That night, he didn't come. So my book is called Americana. It's about a girl who um, immigrated to America from Africa. And, oh, I can? Okay. And, and she writes blog posts, so I'm gonna read one of her blog posts. To my fellow non-American blacks, in America, you're a black baby. Dear non-American black, when you make the choice to come to America, you become black. Stop arguing. Stop saying I'm Jamaican or I'm Ghanaian. America doesn't care. So what if you weren't black in your country? You're in America now. We all have our moments of initiation into the society of former Negroes. Mine was in a class in undergrad when I was asked to give the black perspective, only I had no idea what that was. So I just made something up and admit it. You say I'm not black only because you know black is at the bottom of America's race ladder and you want none of that. Don't deny now. What if being black had all the privileges of being white? Would you still say, don't call me bla black, I'm from Trinidad? I didn't think so. So you're black, baby. And here's the deal with becoming black. You must show that you are offended with such words as watermelon or tar baby are used in jokes, even if you don't know what is being talked about. And since you are non-American black, the chances that you, will, you won't know, you won't know, sorry. In undergrad, a white classmate asked if I liked watermelon. I say yes, and another classmate, oh my God, that is so racist and I'm confused. Wait, how? You must nod back when a black person nods at you in a, in a heavily white area. It's called the black nod. It's a way for black people to say, you're not alone, I'm here too. In describing black women you admire, always use the word strong because that is what black women are supposed to be in America. If you are a woman, please do not speak your mind as you are used to doing in your country. Because in America, strong-minded black women are scary. And if you are a man, be hyper mellow. Never get too excited or somebody will worry that you're about to pull a gun. When you watch television and hear that racist slur was used, you must immediately become offended, even though you are thinking, but why won't they tell me exactly what was said? Even though you would like to be able to decide for yourself how offended to be or whether to be offended at all, you must nevertheless be very offended. When a crime is reported, pray that it was not committed by a black person. And if it turns out to be committed by a black person, stay well aware from the crime area for weeks or you might be stopped for fitting the profile. If a black cash register gives poor service to the non-black person in front of you, compliment that person's shoes or something to make up for the bad service because you're just as guilty for the cashier's crimes. If you are in an Ivy League college and a young Republican tells you that you got in only because of affirmative action, do not whip out your perfect grades from high school. Instead, Gently point out that the biggest beneficiaries of affirmative action are white women. If you go to eat in a restaurant, please tip generously. Otherwise, the next black person who comes in will get awful service because waiters groan when they get a black table. You see, black people have a gene that makes them not tip, so please overpower that gene. If you are telling a non-black person about something racist that happened to you, make sure you are not bitter. Don't complain. Be forgiving. If possible, make it funny. Most of all, do not be angry. Black people are not supposed to be angry about racism. Otherwise, you get no sympathy. This, this applies only for white liberals, by the way. Don't even bother telling a white conservative about anything racist that happened to you because the conservative will tell you that you are the real racist and your mouth will hang open in confusion.
Okay, this is um, a poem, The Man Who Makes Brooms, from 19 Varieties of Gazelle. So you come with these maps in your head, and I come with voices chiding me to speak for my people, and we march around like guardians of memory till we find the man on the short stool who makes brooms. Thumb over thumb, straw over straw, he will not look at us. In his stony corner there is barely room for baskets and thread, much less the weight of our faces staring at him from the street. What he lost has lost, nor his loss is his secret. You say he is like all men, the man who sells pistachios, the man who rolls the rugs. Older now, you find holiness in anything. That continues, dream after dream. I say he is like nobody. The pink seam he weaves across the flat golden face of his broom is its own shrine, and forget about the tears. In the village, the uncles will raise their kefias from dominoes to say, no brooms in America? And the girls who stoop to sweep the courtyard will stop for a moment and cock their heads. It is a little song, this thumb over thumb, but sometimes when you wait years for the air to break open and sense to fall out, it may be the only one. That's it. I'm going to be reading a passage from the book, How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accents, that takes place in the Dominican Republic. The road through the foothills is just wide enough for two small car cars. And so at each curve, as she's been instructive, Yolanda slows and taps her horn. Just past one bad curve, a small shrine has been erected, La Virgen, surrounded by three concrete crosses, recently whitewashed. She pulls the dot center over and enjoys her first solitary moment since arrival. Every compound outing has been hosted by one gracious aunt or another, presenting the landscape as if it were a floor show mounted for her niece's appreciation. All around her are the foothills, a dark enormous green, the sky more a brightness than a color. A breeze blows through the palms below, rustling their branches so they whisper like voices. Here and there, a branch blows through a... Here and there, a braid of smoke rises up from a hillside, a campesino and his family living out their solitary life. This is what she has been missing all these years without really knowing that she has been missing it. Standing here in the quiet, she believes she has never felt at home in the States. Never. When she first hears it, she thinks it is her own motor she has forgotten to turn off. But the sound grows into a pained roar, as if the engine was f were falling apart. Yolanda makes out an undertow of men's voices. Quickly, she gets into the car, locks the door, and pulls back onto the road, hugging her right side. A bus comes lurching around the curve, obscuring her view. Belching exhaust. The driver saluting or warning with a series of blasts on his horn. It is an old army bus, the official name brushed over with paint that doesn't quite match. The passengers see her only at the last moment, and all up and down her side of the bus. Men poke out of the window, hooting and yelling, hold out, holding out bottles and beckoning to her, to her. She speeds up and leaves them behind, the quiet, well-oiled Dotson climbing easily up the snaky high highway. The radio is all static, like the sound of the crunching metal of a car. The faint, blurry voice on the airwaves, her own, trapped inside a wreck, calling for help, in English or Spanish. She wonders. That poet she met at Lucinda's party the night before arg argues that no matter how much of it one lost, in the midst of some profound emotion, one would revert to one's mother tongue. He put Yolanda through a series of situations. What language, he asked, looking pointedly into her eyes, did she love in?
Is there a way to like? There we go. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna be reading George or Melissa's story by Alex Gina. Gino. Do I start it on this chapter or read this page? Okay. Mom didn't say anything in the car about the fight. Instead, she turned on the radio station that promised vintage modern rock and sang along with the choruses. When they got home, Mom suggested George wash up. In the bathroom, George combed her hair forward. If she squinted at the mirror, she almost looked like a girl. For now, anyway. Today, her skin was smooth, but someday testosterone would grow a terrible beard all over her face. Scott had already started to sprout awake were awkward tufts under his shirt. She brushed her hair to its usual style and headed to her room to flop on her bed. A few minutes later, a quiet knock came on her bedroom door. Can I come in? Mom asked. Yeah. George sat up and Mom took a seat at the front of the bed. George, I'm going to be honest. I worry about you. There are a lot of kids like Jeff out there, and plenty who are worse. Mom blew a puff of air up at her bangs. I mean, being gay is one thing. Kids are coming out much earlier than when I was young. It won't be easy, but we'll deal with it. But being that kind of gay? Mom shook her head. That's something else entirely. I'm not any kind of gay, at least. George didn't think she was gay. She knew who she liked, really, boys or girls. Then why did I find all those girls' magazines in your closet? Mom raised an eyebrow and curved wrinkle formed on her forehead. George drew a deep breath, held it, and let it out. Then another. Because I'm a girl. Mom's face relaxed, and she gave a short laugh. Is that what this is about? Oh, gee. I was there when you were born. I changed your diapers, and I promise you, you're a 100% boy. Besides, you're only 10 years old. You don't know how to f you'll know how to feel in a few years. George's heart sank. She couldn't wait years. She could hardly wait another minute. Tell you what, Mom said, patting George's knee. How about we do something special tonight? Let's go to Arnie's. Arnie's all-you-can-eat buffet was George's favorite restaurant. You'll feel better once you're eating nachos and pizza and pie like a regular kid. For now, just chill for a bit. That's what I'm going to do. George's mom knew... George knew what mom was trying to make her feel better, but it didn't really work. Nothing, certainly not a buffet dinner, could help the fact that Mom didn't see her. Mom paid at the door and unleashed her children on the buffet while she found a table. George filled her plate with fried chicken, mashed potatoes, corn fritters, pizza, a pile of nachos, and a cube of cherry jello hidden under a taco to eat, to eat while Mom was getting her own food. Even at Artie's, Mom said you could have dinner before dessert. You should have. <laughs> George went back to the table while Mom took a turn at, er, at the buffet. Scott sat down soon after. What's up, Mom? He asked from behind. A plate piled with ham, turkey, and chicken, topped with two slices of pizza. She never takes us out to Arnie's on a weekday unless she's upset about something. Yeah, well, George looked over at Mom, who was still picking out lettuce for a salad. I kind of got into a fight at school. Scott's head shot up in surprise, and his brow grew heavy. When I got into a fight at school, I got grounded. How did you work Artie's out of it? I also kind of told her something. It must have been big. Mom staring at the beats like a zombie. It was. Did you tell her you were gay? Scott twisted his fork into a pile of mashed potatoes. You know I'm okay, okay with that, right? Before Dad left, he made me promise to take care of you. He said you were like that. I'm not gay, George said. Why did everybody think she was gay? Whatever, I don't care. My friend Matt is gay. It's no big deal. But it was a big deal. I told her I think I'm a girl. Oh. That was all Scott said at first. Oh. Scott chewed, swallowed, and took another bite of pizza. The background noise at, of the restaurant throbbed in George's ears. She wished Scott would say something, even if it was mean. Oh. Scott took a bite of turkey. Oh. Scott began to nod slowly. He turned to George, whose stomach had jumped with each O, and now was ready nearly in her throat. 
That's more than just being gay. No wonder she's freaking out. I know. Scott put down his fork. So do you? Do you what? Think you're a girl? Yes. George was surprised at how easy that question was to answer. Oh. Scott ripped a hunk of off a roll with his teeth and chewed thoughtfully. Mom returned with a green salad, topped with raw vegetables and vinaigrette dressing. She finished it quickly and dropped her plate off in a dish bin. Mom always started her meal at Arnie's with a salad. She said it was healthy, not to mention delicious, but she always ate it quickly, then returned with a plate as just decadent as George and Scott's. Scott had nearly gnawed silently on a chicken wing while Mom ate her salad. But when she got up and approached the appetizer bar, he dropped the bone onto his plate. I know about your magazines, he said. Mom told you? Nah, I found them this weekend. I knew Mom was upset about something, and I saw the bag sitting on her bed. Dude, I thought you had porn or something in there, so I took a peek. You know, just to find out what kind of stuff my little bro is into, so I figured you were gay. But I didn't mean it like that. Scott popped a corn fritter into his mouth. So... Do you, do you, like, want to, he made a gesture with two fingers like a pair of scissors, go all the way? George squeezed her legs together. Maybe someday. Weird, but it kind of makes sense. No offense. You don't make a very good boy. I know. Mom returned to the table, and conversation was dropped. All three of them stuffed their faces, and they, dr- they dragged their full stomachs to the car, groaning all the way, much like a Templeton, the rat, after a night of indulgence at the fair. All three of them crashed in front of the television when they got home and watched a sitcom about family with 12 kids. The jokes mostly focused on the empty fridge and full bathroom. George wondered what it'd be like to live with so many people. Maybe each kid got noticed less. With mom eyeballing her from her chair, George wondered whether maybe that it wasn't such a bad thing. Scott snuck glances her way too. But where mom's eyes were filled with concern and confusion, Scott looked at George as if his sibling made sense to him for the first time. George had never been gladder to have an older brother. Hey guys, my name is Woodford, and uh, I'm going to be reading a poem by Maya Angelou called uh, Caged Bird. Um, I first read uh, Maya Angelou's autobiography, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, in uh, sixth grade. And um, it was one of the first books that uh, I read that had more, um, uh, it dealt with more mature subjects. uh, And um, it helped me realize that uh, everybody has a, a very deep, and um, you know, complex story that describes them, and you can't just uh, assume and realize those those things, the parts of their story, just by looking at them. So this is uh, Cage Bird by Maya Angelou. Um, a free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends, and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied as he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown unknown and longed for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill for the cage bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze and the trade winds soft through the sighing trees and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams. His shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied. So he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown, but long for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill for the caged bird sings of freedom. Thank you.
How do I lower this? I'll just... <laughs> As some of the tallest trees in the world, redwoods can grow up to 350 feet above the earth, yet their roots on average only travel 10 feet into it and, or into it in isolation. It should be physically impossible for them to stand. However, these enormous trees do not grow in isolation. Their roots, each only a single inch thick, wrap around the roots of its neighbors. A stubborn foundation of brown fingers clasps an underground stand and grows. My family is a group of redwoods that sought God instead of ground. Whether my mom or when my mom immigrated to the United States from wait, uh, Sam, uh, I can't remember the name. Uh, she taught none of her children how to speak our native tongue. Now, 26 years later, I cannot feel the hands of the land I come from. How do you stand when your roots have been burned away? Today, I am a tree toppling over a man cut off at the knees, stuck between a loved language lost and a sky still out of reach. And that is the true legacy of World War II in the Pacific, a generation of islanders and Asian immigrants who learned that their foreign accents and different skins could mean your family in internment camps learned their place in the society only could be brought with blood and uniform they learned their citizenship papers would only be traced for their uh, several tongues and it's true uh, that the branch of a tree may spread no wider than its roots but when parents countries are just word for poverty then you are made to choose between putting your child in co culture or clothing which blood would you want this is how redwoods fall. They forget the only reason that they are able to stand and defy common logic is how they hold one one another. In Hawaii, an immigrant Mecca, uh, where so many of us try to stand with a lost past, we have old weeping banyas trees who also come from across the sea. These banyas start from seeds that are blown to the other canopies, and without pity or regret or past, they create their own way to ground, sprouting aerials, roots that crawl, crawl to the earth and make a home wherever they find it. In Polynesia, they have always learned from the earth around us. So now I'm not blamed by my roots of, my lack of roots, instead I grow them myself. So every day I am with, wild blown seeds. I am foreign accents and different skins. Every day I fall towards the earth and am reborn in dirt. I am blood and uniform and several tongue. Every day I am the blood I want. Every day I look around, hold on tight to those I love, and I grow into an extended family tree. It was also Simone, the word. Sim Simone. Like the cookie. So I'll be reading Blood Water Paint, which is about a female Renaissance painter. Everything begins from here, the viewing point, the place where you stand, your eye level, that single point on the horizon where all other lines converge. Sometimes when I breathe in, the linseed oil and turpentine and roll my brush between my fingers, when I train my eyes on what's ahead, my purpose, and listen only the rise and fall of my own breath as I connect the brush to the paint, to my breath, to the canvas. I shut out the rest. And then my father's rants, tirades, rages over debts, commissions, and jealousies. Recede to the background, underpainting that'll cover up with strokes of my own choosing. I do not hear him, criticize technique, complain that I strayed from his intent. Remind me who the painter is. It's funny how the painter is not the one with pigment smeared onto her skin, the one whose body is as a permanent fixture in the studio, a stool, palette, easel, the only one whose heart is flung across the canvas. No. The painter merely signs his name and takes his gold. Gold could be the answer to the holy child's curls. Plain brown, and he's no different from my younger brothers at our mother's breasts. I study my palette and wonder how to blend a luminescent glow. I do not notice father stalking toward me till he flings his arm towards the easel and knocks a crock of brushes on the floor. I can't tell who it's supposed to be. I sit back, ask, assess the single of the Virgin Mary's arm as she cradles her holy child. Little wonder, you do not recognize him. When was the last time you accompanied us to mass? Don't get smart with me. My father spits his word, flex of rage arching over my head and slopping baby Jesus on the cheek. If your brothers showed any promise, they don't. 
I ought to paint with lighter strokes, dwelling on my talentless brothers, only incites him. They limit his prospects, leaving him for his apprentice, nothing but a 17-year-old girl. Hola a todos. Mi nombre es el señor Ojeda. Soy profesor de español en el Upper School. Voy a leer unos poemas de mi libro Corazón. Hola a todos. Mi nombre es el señor Ojeda. Soy profesor. profesor de español en el Upper School. Hola a todos. Mi nombre es el señor Ojeda. Soy profesor de español en el Upper School. Voy a leer unos poemas de mi libro Corazón sin borrador. Corazón sin borrador es un libro de poemas en español. La primera poesía se llama Mis clases y tú. En clase de matemáticas eres un número infinito. En clase de ciencias eres una teoría que explica mi vida. En clase de música eres armonía de mi día. En clase de arte eres el color que alegra mi tristeza. En clase de geografía eres mapas sin fronteras. Y en mi clase de español, eres mi nuevo mundo. Otro poema se llama Me duele. Me duele la cabeza de tanto estudiar. Me duele el estómago por tanto comer. Me duelen los brazos de tanto escribir. Me duelen las piernas de tanto correr. Me duelen los pies de tanto caminar. Me duelen las manos por tantos videos, juegos, jugar. Me duelen los ojos de tanto instagramear. 
Me duele la espalda por tantos libros cargar. Pero cuando te veo, quiero estudiar más. Se me pasa el hambre. Escribo poemas. Soy el más rápido en el equipo de fútbol. Eres la fuerza oculta que me da energía al despertar. Y el último se llama la importancia de las matemáticas. Todos los maestros me dicen que las matemáticas son importantes en la vida. Mientras hago mi tarea de ecuaciones, me pregunto si la suma me ayudará a tener más amigos. Si la resta me ayudará a olvidar las penas. Y si la multiplicación permitirá ayudar a los necesitados. Y si la división traerá equidad y paz. Todos los maestros insisten en que aprenda matemáticas. Mientras tanto me pregunto si el álgebra me ayudará a balancear las malas cuentas del corazón. Si el cálculo me ayudará a saber qué tanto caminar y si con la geometría podré con exactitud definir el área en que debo concentrarme para encontrar la otra mitad de mi corazón. Muchas gracias. Entonces son poemas de mi libro Corazón sin borrador. Adiós. Gracias. Bonjour tout le monde. Je m'appelle Madame Hoban. Um, I'm going to be reading you a very short uh, cartoon today. Um, it's called Avni. And um, you may not speak French or it's maybe a little bit above where you are, but I hope you enjoy it. And I'll try to help you understand a little bit as we go. Um, it's called, the, the cartoons are called Avni. And this one is called Grand Grand Mami. Grand Mami is basically great grandma. J'aime passer du temps avec mon arrière grand-mère. Il adore, il adore son arrière grand-mère. Okay? Elle sait faire plein de choses incroyables. Sa grand-mère est fantastique. Elle est incroyable. On dirait qu'elle arrive à Contrôler les gens, sans même leur parler. Seems that grandma has special powers. And we're going to learn about these special powers. Je vous en prie, madame, prenez ma place. Oh, merci. Trop fort. Strangers come up to her in the bus and offer her their seat. And grandma is so happy. And Avni is just like, how does she make them do that? C'est dingue, ça marche à tout coup. Attends, mamie, laisse-moi découper ton repas. La chance! At dinner time, the mom offers to cut up her food for her. And Avni is just like, what about me? Why does anyone cut up my food? Elle peut aussi dormir tout en restant debout. Elle est en train de dormir. Mais comment elle fait ça? She's able to fall asleep standing. What a miracle. Autre phénomène intéressant. But je déteste ce bruit. Ça me frasse les oreilles. Mais elle ne craint aucun son. Même les plus, les plus bruyants. C'est bien calme aujourd'hui. Grandma is not bothered by really loud noises. It's like she can't even hear them. She just blocks them out. And here she says, C'est très bien calme aujourd'hui. It's so calm today. Sapriche, où sont passées mes lunettes? That's weird. Elle sait faire disparaître les objets. She can even make stuff disappear. 
Elle peut même retirer ses dents. Oh! Elle sort les dents. Grand mamie est pleine de mystères. Mais au moins, une chose est sûre. Je comprends mieux d'où viennent mes pouvoirs. So, Grandma is full of mysteries, but it helps him understand that he, where he gets his own powers from. And at the bottom, he says, Je te dois tout, grand-mère. I owe you everything. Avni is lots of short, little, funky stories like this one. I hope you enjoyed it. Au revoir. Vamos a leer el libro de María y su llama. María tiene una llama. Mira la llama de María. Esta es una llama del Perú. So, es posible que María viva en el Perú. ¿Dónde queda el Perú? En Sudamérica. ¿Cuál es la capital de Perú? Mm, no sé. I know you know. María tiene una llama, escrito por Ángela Domínguez. Esta es María y esta es la llama de María. María tiene una llamita, una llama pequeña. Oh, mire, está la casa de María, las flores y las llamas pequeñas. María tiene una llamita. María tiene una llamita. Aquí está María. Oh, a ella le gusta hacer música. Tiene un instrumento de música. Esta es la casa de María. ¿Dónde vive María? ¿Dónde vive María? La llama de María es blanca y suave como la nieve. Es blanca como la nieve. Mire dónde vive María con su llamita. Y donde va María, va la llamita. La llamita es palo en María. Aquí está María. ¿Dónde vive María? Aquí está Andes. In the Andes Mountains. Y cerca de la capital de Perú vive María. La llama sigue a María. Un día, la llamita siguió María a María a la escuela. So, María va a la escuela. Ella lleva la mochila. ¿Qué color la mochila de María? ¿Qué color la gorra de María? María tiene un poncho café porque hace frío o hace calor. ¿A dónde va María? María va a la escuela y la llamita va a la escuela con María. Este es el Little Town, pequeño pueblo donde vive María. Están las casas, hay un mercado, el Little Store, una tienda y la escuela donde va María. Pero en la escuela no puede estar la llamita porque la escuela es para los niños y las niñas. La llamita va a la escuela de María y los niños están felices porque ellos miran a la llamita. Mire, ¿cuántos niños hay? Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. ¿Cuántos niños están en la clase con María? ¿Quién es 
la maestra de María. La maestra dice que la llamita tiene que ir afuera. She needs to go out de la escuela. Pero la llamita mira a María desde la ventana. Y la llamita se queda esperando pacientemente. She was waiting for María. Desde las nueve, diez, once, doce, una, dos, oh, tres. ¿Cuántas horas esperó la llamita a María? ¿Cuántas horas? How many hours? La llamita esperó a María. Y al fin apareció María. La llamita está feliz y María está feliz porque she is con su amiga llamita. ¿Por qué la llama quiere ver tanto a María? Preguntan los niños. Why la llamita wants to be with María? La maestra dice porque María quiere mucho a la llama. Picos María love la llama. The end. Fin. So, María está con la llamita. Remember, ¿dónde vive María? Y hay muchas personas que están con unos instrumentos de música. They are celebrating de que María está con la llamita. Solitude. The not happening was so sudden that I stayed there forever, without knowing, without their knowing me, as if I were under a chair, as if I were lost in the night. Not being was like that, and I stayed that way forever. Afterwards, I asked the others, the women, the men, what they were doing so confidently and how they learned how to live. They did not actually answer, They went on dancing and living. What determines the silence is what doesn't happen. And I don't want to keep on talking, for I stayed there waiting in that place on that day. I have no idea what happened to me, but now I am not the same. Insomnia. In the middle of the night, I ask myself, what will happen to Chile? What will become of my poor, poor dark country? From loving this long, thin strip so much, these stones, these little farms, the durable rose of the coast that lives among the foam, I became one with my country. I met every one of its sons, and in me, the seasons succeeded on one another, weeping or flowering. I feel that now, with the dead year of doubt scarcely over, now that the mistakes which bled us all are over and we begin to plan again a better and just life, the menace once again appears, and on the walls a rising rancor. I'm good. Okay. 
Okay, this is a book I read to uh, my two kids by an Ojibwe author, so an author who's indigenous to North America. It's called uh, Nibi Msowadong, which is um, Anishinaabe is the language. It's an indigenous language, and it's called The Water Walker, the translation. I'm just going to read parts of it. Nokomis loved Nibi. And Nibi loved Nokomis. And Nokomis means um, grandmother in Anishinaabe, and Nibi means water. Okay, so grandmother loves water, and the water loves grandmother. Rain or shine, hot or cold, calm or wild. Every morning, like the women in her family before her, Nokomis hopped out of bed and before doing anything else, she sang Gichi Miguich, which means thank you very much, Nibi, for the life you give to every level, every living thing on earth. I love you. I respect you. But one day, a wise Ojima which means chief, told her, in my lifetime, the day will come when an ounce of water costs more than an ounce of gold. What are you going to do about it? Like an arrow, his words pierced Nokomis's heart. She looked around. She saw how people were disrespecting the water, wasting it, making it unfit for life. Day turned to night, night turned to weeks, and Nokomis remembered the Ojima's words. A few moons went by, and then one night Nokomis had a bawijan, which is a dream. Early next morning, Nokomis called her sister, over her sisters over for tea to talk about their responsibility to protect Nibi. Four days later, Nukomis and the Mother Earth Water Walkers, as they came to be known, found themselves standing on the side of the road wearing sneakers. Nukomis call carried a copper pail full of Nibi in one hand and a Majizi staff in the other. If no one noticed Nibi, Maybe they would notice the water walkers. Maybe somebody would ask why they carried Nibi in their copper pail. Maybe someone would be moved to protect Nibi too. Nikomis and the Mother Earth water walkers walked around the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. They walked every spring for seven years. They prayed and sang to Nibi. They left Sima, which is a like sacred tobacco. In every lake, river, stream, and puddle they met. They got up before the birds and went to bed when Nukomis rose. There's a little bit more about all the walking they do, but I'm gonna jump ahead. Nukomis went through three knees and 11 pairs of sneakers walking for Nibi. She got her knees replaced and is at home resting up, taking the time to surf online for new sneakers. Every morning she puts down her Sima for Nibi and sings her gratitude. She prays people wake up and realize that without Nibi, there is no life. And she continues to wonder, what are you going to do about it? That's the end. Thank you. Okay, so the book I'm going to read is Mommy, Mama, and Me. It's by Lalisa Newman. Mommy picks me up, up, up. 
Mama pours juice in my cup. Mommy gently combs my hair. Mama rocks me in her chair. Mommy packs a yummy snack. Mama rides me on her back. Mommy and I go round and round. Mama and I slide to the ground. Mommy and I count one, two, three. Mama hides behind a tree. Mommy hi hugs me on her lap. Mama lays me down to nap. Mommy lets me help her cook. Mama helps me read a book. Mommy puts me in the tub. Mama bathes me, scrub, scrub, scrub. Now I'm tucked in, nice and tight. Mommy and Mama kiss me goodnight. The end. <laughs> I'm Calissa, and I'm going to read the poem, I Ask My Mother to Sing, by Lee Young Lee. She begins, and my grandmother joins her, mother and daughter sing like young girls. If my father were alive, he would play his accordion and sway like a boat. I've never been in Peking or the summer palace, nor stood on the great stone boat to watch the rain begin on Quenming Lake, the picnickers running away in the grass. But I love to hear it sung, how the water lilies fill with rain until they overturn, spilling water into water, then rock back and fill with more. Both women have begun to cry, but neither stops her song. My name is Judah God Sam Ring. Um, where I'm from by Kane Alexander. I'm from B Black Cadillacs, from plastic covered sofas and tiny pink houses. I'm from the, the one bathroom we all shared in living room. You staying out of. I'm from Friday fried fish and chocolate birthday cakes, from Lovey Brothers slacks and shiny white shoes, from Cash and Bird, from storytellers and good looks, from Don't Say You Can't Till You Try. I'm from the Kentucky Derby in the land of baseball bats. From two Cassius Clays before me, one black, one white. I am from slavery and to freedom. From the West End to Smoketown. From the unfilled dreams of my father to the hula hoops from of my mama. I am Jack and I'm going to be reading on turning 10. The whole idea makes me feel like I'm coming down with something. Something worse than a stomach ache or the headaches I get from reading in bad light. A kind of measles of the spirit, mumps of the psyche, or disfiguring chicken pox of the soul. You tell me it's too early to be looking back, but that is because you have forgotten the perfect simplicity of being one and the beautifully complexity of being two. But I can lie on my bed and remember every digit. At four, I was an Arabian wizard. I could make myself invisible by drinking a glass of milk in a certain way. At seven, I was a soldier. At nine, a prince. But now I am mostly at the window watching the late afternoon light. Back then, it never felt so solemnly against the side of my treehouse. My bicycle leaned against the garage, as it does today. All the dark blue speed drained out of it. This is the beginning of sadness, I say to myself as I walk through the universe in my sneakers. It's time to say goodbye to my imaginary friends. It's time to turn the first big number. It seems only yesterday I used to believe that there was nothing under my skin but light. If you cut me, I could shine. But now when I fall upon the sidewalks of life, I bleed.
Uh, I'm Kayla, and I'm going to read The Water Princess. I am Princess Gigi. My kingdom, the African sky, so wide and so close. I can also, I can almost touch the sharp edges of the stars. I can tame the wild dogs with my song. I can make the tall grass sway when I dance. I can make the wind play hide and seek. But I cannot make the water come closer. I cannot make the water run clearer, no matter what I command. It's still early morning, still dark. My mother wakes me, Gigi, my princess. It is time to get up. We must collect the water. Water, come. Do not make me wake before even the sun is out of bed, I demand. Come, please, I say. But the water won't listen, and I know we will have to walk so far to the well. I'm too sleepy to put on my crown. I think of the pot that will rest on my braids instead. The thirst comes quick, dry lips, dry throat. I squeeze my eyes shut, I see it, clear. I dip my toes in it, cool. I, swip it, I scoop it up and bring it to my lips. Slowly, I open my eyes, nothing. I kick the dust. I grab my empty pot and place it upon my head. My mother does the same and our journey begins full song. My maman adds her melody. Our steps are light, we twirl and laugh together. The mile gives us room to dance. Halfway there, we stop for a moment at the giant karite tree, long enough to grab a handful of sweet shea nuts for energy. We can keep the dance going just a little longer. Aman, are we there yet? Finally, I hear water running from the well, the giggles of my friends, the chatter of women. Some have traveled farther than I, only to return home when the sun has gone to bed. Maman holds our place while I play with friends. The dance continues. The water is flowing. Pots filling with the dusty earth-colored liquid. Gigi, come. Maintenant. My turn now. The dance home has, be has slowed to careful steps. My they're so heavy like the full pot I carry. Our song is softer now. Our shoulders ache, our feet cramp. I see home at last. Maman boils enough water for drinking. We wait. We wash our clothes. We prepare, we prepare food for cooking. My father comes quickly from the fields to share the drink and meal. He scoops me up. My princess, you have returned with the water. Drink, my mom says. Every sip fills me with energy. I want to make it last, but I can't. I gulp it down. Clothes and body clean, I sing to the dogs. I dance with the tall grass. I hide from the wind. My mom brings one last cup she has saved just for me. Drink, my princess. Sleep, my princess. Tomorrow we journey again. Maman, I say as I close my eyes. Why is the water so far? Why is the water not clear? Where is our water? Sleep, she says. Dream, she says. Someday you will find a way, my princess. Someday. I am Princess Gigi, my kingdom, the African sky, the dusty earth, and someday the flowing, cool, crystal clear water. Someday. I'm going to be reading Remember by Joy, by Joy Harjo. Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the stars' story. Remember the moon. Know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth and how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father. He has your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are. Red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life who, have their, who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them. Listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind. Remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember you are all people and all people are you. Remember you are this universe and this universe is you. Remember all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember language comes from this. Remember the dance language is that life is. Remember. I'm Caroline and I'm going to read a poem too by Rajani LaRocca. I have two lives, one that is Indian, one that is not. 
I have two best friends, one who is Indian, one that is not. At school, I swim in a river of white skin and blonde hair and brown hair and blue eyes and green eyes and hazel. School subjects and giggles about boys, salads and sandwiches. And on weekends, I float in a sea of brown skin, black hair and dark eyes. MTV music videos, giggles about boys, samosas and sabjis. In both places, I have gossip and laughter, music and silence, friendship. But only in one place do I have my parents. All right. I love you guys were reading poetry. It's one of my favorite uh, forms of literature. So I'm reading uh, from one of my favorite uh, authors, Jacqueline Woodson, and this is Brown Girl Dreaming. All right. I just did a couple. All right. So the first one is entitled Changes. Now the evenings are quiet with my mother's gone. As, as though the night is listening to the way we are counting the days, we know even the feel of our grandmother's brush being pulled gently through our hair will fast become a memory. Those Saturday evenings at her kitchen table, the smell of Dixie peach hair grease, the sizzle of the straightening comb, the hiss of the iron against damp, newly washed ribbons, all of this may happen again, but in another place. We sit on our grandmother's porch, shivering although already against the coming winter and talk softly about Greenville summer. How when we come back, we'll do all the stuff we always did, hear the same stories, laugh at the same jokes, catch fireflies in the same mason jars, promise each other future summers that are as good as the past. But we know we are lying. Coming home will be different now. This place called Greenville, this neighborhood called Nickel Town will change some and so will each of us. This one is entitled The Johnny Pump. Some days we miss the way the red dirt lifted up and landed against our bare feet. Here the sidewalks burn hot all summer long. Here we wear shoes, broken bottles, don't always get swept up right away. But our block has three Johnny Pumps and a guy with a wrench in to, uh, to turn them on. On the days when the heat stops your breath, he comes up the block, pulling it out of his pocket. Then the Johnny Pump is blasting cold water everywhere and us and other kids running through it refreshed and laughing. Even the grown-ups come out sometimes. Once I saw my never ever barefoot outside in the city mother take off her sandals, stand at the curb and let the cool water run over her feet. She was looking up at the sky, the tiny piece of sky and she was smiling. That's that one. <laughs> Do I have some time for a couple more? A couple more? Okay. All right. This is genetics. My mother has a gap between her two front teeth. So daddy gunner. So does daddy gunner. Each child in this family has the same space connecting us. Our baby brother Roman was born pale as dust. His soft brown curls and eyelashes stop people on the street. Whose angel child is this? They want to know. When I say my brother, the people wear doubt, thick as a cape until we smile and the cape falls. Okay. All right. This is lessons. My mother says when mama tried to teach me to make collards and potato salad, I didn't want to learn. She opens the box of pancake mix adds milk and eggs and stirs. I watch, grateful for the food we have now, syrup waiting in the cabinet, bananas to slice on top. It's Saturday morning, five days a week, she leaves us to work at the office back in Brownville, Brownsville. Saturday, we have her to ourselves all day long. Me and Kay didn't want to be inside cooking. She stirs the lumps from the batter, pours it into the buttered hissing pan. Wanting, wanted to be with our friends, running wild through Greenville. There was a man with a peach tree down the road. One day, Robert climbed over the fence, filled a bucket with peaches. Wouldn't share them with any of us, but told us where the peach tree was. And that's where we wanted to be, 
sneaking peaches from the man's tree, throwing the rotten ones at your uncle. Mama wanted us to learn to cook. Ask the boys, we said, and Mama knew that it wasn't fair, girls inside and boys going off to steal peaches. So she let us, she, so she let us all go, stay outside until supper time. And by then, she says, putting our breakfast on the table, it was too late. Right. I just got one more. Is that okay? Okay. All right. Um, okay, this is reading. I am not my sister. Words from the books curl around each other, make little sense until I read them again and again, the story settling into memory. Too slow, the teacher says, read faster. Too babyish, the teacher says, read older. But I don't want to read faster or older or any way or, or any, sorry, or any way else that might make the story disappear too quickly from where it's settling inside my brain, slowly becoming a part of me. A story I will remember long after I've read it for the second, third, tenth, hundred time. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. It's amazing. Can I get a copy of Okay. Okay. Um, release. For the first time since Dando died, for the first time since we left our farm, for the first time in a long time, Muma and I held each other and cry together. Muma's arms folded around me, so feeble. All of her is shaking like from a fever. Both our faces wet. Tears on our chins, on our necks, soaking the fabric of our wrinkled cottons. My arms small beneath Muma's, but strong enough to show my, mom, my mother she's allowed to cry. Now, after so much time traveling through dry sand, now, after so much walking among brittle dirt, now, after working hard like camels to store all that's inside, Muma and I surrender to something we fought to hold off, knowing that if we let it begin, it, we may never stop. Here comes gut sound starting slow, building then melting to shuttered breasts until finally we sleep. Oh, that's my favorite, yeah. Hmm. All right, so I am Jesse Holtzman Rich, and I'm going to be reading a fun poem by Nancy Willard. It's called Questions My Son Asked Me, Answers I Never Gave Him. Question one Do gorillas have birthdays? Answer Yes. Like the rainbow, they happen. Like the air, they are not observed. Question two, do butterflies make a noise? Answer, the wire in the butterfly's tongue hums gold. Some men hear butterflies, even in winter. Question three, are they part of our family? Answer, they forgot us, who forgot how to fly. Question four, who tied my navel? Did God tie it? Answer, God made the thread. Oh man, live forever. Man made the knot, enough is enough. Number five, if I drop my tooth in the telephone, will it go through the wires and bite someone's ear? 
Answer. I have seen earlobes pierced by a tooth of steel. It loves what lasts. It does not love flesh. It leaves a ring of gold in the wound. Six. If I stand on my head, will the sleep in my eye roll up into the head? Answer. Does the dream know its own father? Can bread go back to the field of its birth? Seven. Can I eat a star? Yes. With the mouth of time that enjoys everything. Could we Xerox the moon? This is the first commandment. I am the moon, thy moon. Thou shalt have no other moons before thee. Who invented water? The hands of the air that wanted to wash each other. What happens at the end of numbers? I see three men running toward a field at the edge of a tall grass. They turn into light. Do the years ever run out? God said, I will break time's heart. Time ran down like an old phonograph. It lay flat as a carpet at rest on its threads. I am learning to fly. I love that poem because it's just so random and like free. Hello, I'm Tilly Maynard, and today I'm going to be reading a poem called On Turning Ten. The whole idea of it makes me feel like I'm coming down to something. Something worse than a stomachache, or the headaches I get from reading, reading in bad light. The kind of measles for the spirit, mumps for the physique, and chicken pox for the soul. You tell me it's too early to be looking back, but it's because you have forgotten. The perfect simplicity of being one, and the beautiful, complex introduction of being two. But I can lie on my bed and remember every digit. At four, I was an Arabian wizard. I could make myself invisible by drinking a glass of milk a certain way. At seven, I was a soldier. At nine, a prince. But now I'm mostly at the window, watching the late afternoon light. Back then, it never fell so solemnly against the side of my treehouse. And my bicycle never leaned against the garage as it does today. All the dark blue speed drained out of it. This is the beginning of sadness, I, said, I say to myself, as I walk through the universe in my sneakers. It is time to say goodbye to my imaginary friends and turn into the first big number. It seems only yesterday I used to believe there was nothing under my skin but light. If you cut me, I could shine. But now when I fall upon the sidewalks of life, I skin my knees, I bleed. I'm also reading a poem called Where I'm From by George L. Lyon. I'm from clothespins and Clorox and carbon tetrachloride. I'm from the dirt under the back porch, black glistening. It tasted like beets. I'm, the, I'm from the fluorescent bush and, Dutch elm, and the Dutch elm, whose long gone limbs I remember as if they were my own. I'm from fudge and eyeglasses. I'm from the know-it-alls and pass-it-ons, from perk up and pipe down. I'm from he restoreth my soul, with cotton ball lamb and 10 verses, I can say myself. I am from fried corn and strong coffee, from the finger my grandfather lost to the auger, the eye my father shut to keep his sight. Under the bed was a dress box, spilling old pictures, a sift of, of lost faces, to drift beneath my dreams. I am from those moments, snapped before I budded, leaf fall from the family tree.
Hello, I'm Ethan Hart, and today I will be. Oh, sorry. Oh, can I take my mask off? Um, I will be reading a poem called Knoxville, Tennessee. I always like summer best. You can eat fresh corn from daddy's garden and okra, greens, and cabbage, and lots of barbecue and buttermilk and homemade ice cream at the church picnic and listen to gospel music outside at the church homecoming and go to your grandma's with your grandmother and go barefooted to be warm all the time, not only when you go to bed and sleep. Um, I'm also... I'm also reading a Where I'm From poem by Kwame Alexander. I'm from black Cadillacs, from plastic-covered sofas and tiny pink houses. I'm from that one bathroom we all shared, in the living room you stayed out of. I'm from Friday fried fish and chocolate birthday cakes, from Levy Brothers slacks and shiny white shoes, from Cash and Bird, from Storytellers and Good Looks, from Don't You Say You Can't Till You Try. I'm from the Kentucky Derby and the land of baseball bats. From the two Cassius Clays before me, one black, one white. I'm from slavery to freedom, from the West End to Smoketown, from the unfulfilled dreams of my father to the hallelujah hopes of my mama. I'm going to read The Tiger by William Blake. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could fear thy fearful symmetry? In what distance deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? And what what the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare it te- its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and wa- watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? I'm Annie Amex. I'm going to be reading a poem called The Marvelous Woman by Syrian American author Mohia Kaf. All women speak two languages, the language of men and the language of silent suffering. Some women speak a third, the language of queens. They are marvelous and they are my friends. My friends give me poetry. If it were not for them, I'd be a seamstress out of work. They send me their dresses and I sew together poems, enormous sails for ocean journeys. My marvelous friends, these women who are elegant and fix engines, who teach gynecology and literacy and work in jails and sing and sculpt and paint the 99 names, who keep each other's secrets and pass on each other's spirits like small packets of leavening. It is from you I fashion poetry. I scoop up in handfuls glittering sequences that fall from your bodies as you fall in love, marry, divorce, get custody, get cats, enter supreme courts of justice and argue with God. You rescuers on galloping steeds of the weak and the wounded, creatures of beauty and passion, powerful workers in love, you are the poems. I am only your stenographer. I'm the hungry transcriber of the conjuring recipes you hoard in the chests of your great grandmothers. My marvelous friends, the women of brilliance in my life who levitate my daughters, 
You are a coat of many colors, and silk tie-dye so gossamer it can be crumpled in one hand. You oris, you mermaids, you swimmers in dangerous waters, defiers of sharks. My marvelous friends, thirsty Hagars and laughing Sarahs, you eloquent radio Aishas, Marys drinking the secret milkshakes of heaven, slinky Zalikas of desire, gay Waladas, Harriets parting the sea, Esthers in the palace, Penelopes of patient scheming. You are the last hope of the shrinking women. You are the last hand to the fallen knights. You are the only epics left in the world. Come with me, come with poetry, jump on this wild chariot, hurry. This is a poem by Nancy Willard, and it's called Questions My Son Asked Me, Answers I Never Gave Him. Question one, do gorillas have birthdays? Answer, yes. Like rainbows, they happen. Like the air, they are not observed. Question two. Do butterflies make a noise? Answer, the wire in the butterfly's tongue hums gold. Some men hear butterflies even in winter. Question three, are they part of our family? Answer, they forget us. Who forgot how to fly? Question four, who tied my navel? Did God tie it? Answer, God made the thread. Oh, man, live forever. Man made the knot. Enough is enough. Question five. If I drop my tooth in the telephone, will it go through the wires and bite someone's ear? I have seen earlobes pierced by a tooth of steel. It loves what lasts. It does not love flesh. It leaves a ring of gold in the wound. If I stand on my head, will the sleep in my eye roll up into the head? Does the dream know its own father? Can I, can bread go back to the field of its birth? Seven, can I eat a star? Yes, with the mouth of time that enjoys everything. Could we Xerox the moon? This is the first commandment. I am the moon, thy moon, thou shalt have no other moons before thee. Who invented water? The hands of the air that wanted to wash each other. What happens at the end of numbers? I see three men running toward a field at the edge of a tall grass. They turn into light. Do years ever run out? God said, I will break time's heart. Time ran down like an old phonograph. It lay flat as a carpet, at rest on its threads. I am learning to fly. Thank you. Uh, this is a poem by Joe Harjo, and it's called Remember. Remember the sky you were, that you were born under. Know each of the star stories. Remember the moon. Know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away to the night. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father. He is your life also. Remember whose skin you are. Remember the earth whose skin you are. Red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth. We are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them. 
Listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind. Remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember you are all people and all people are you. Remember you are this universe and this universe is you. Remember all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember language comes from this. Remember the dance language is, that life is. Remember. And uh, here are more some short other poems by Langston Hughes. Dream Deferred. What happens to a dream defer deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? Or crust over and or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? And then youth, we have tomorrow, bright before us like a flame. Yesterday, a night gone thing, a sundown name. And dawn today, broad above the road we came, we march. And then dr the dream keeper, bring me all of your dreams, your, you dreamers, bring me all of your heart melodies that I may wrap them in blue cloth, blue cloud cloth, away from the two rough fingers of the world. And then the last one, mother to son. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal air. It had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up in places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time I've been climbing on and reaching ladder, landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn your back. Don't you set down the, on the steps cause you find it's kind of hard. Don't you fall now for I still going, honey. I still climbing and f life for me ain't been no crystal air. My first poem is On Turning Ten by Billy Collins. The whole idea of it makes me feel like I'm coming down with something, something worse than a stomach ache or the headaches I get from reading in bad light. A kind of measles of the spirit, a mumps of the psyche, a, diff a disfiguring chicken pox of the soul. You tell me it is too early to be looking back but that is because you've forgotten the perfect simplicity of being one and the beautiful complexity introduced by two. But I can lie on my bed and remember every digit. At four, I was, I was an Arabian wizard. I can make myself invisible by drinking a glass of milk a certain way. At seven, I was a soldier. At nine, a prince. But now I'm mostly at the window watching the late afternoon light. Back then, it never felt so solemnly against the side of my treehouse and my bicycle never leaned against the garage as it does today. All the dark blue speed drained out of it. This is the beginning of sadness, I say to myself as I walk through the universe in my sneakers. It's time to say goodbye to my imaginary friends. Time to turn the first big number. It seems only yesterday I used to believe there was nothing under my skin but light. If you cut me, I could shine. But now when I fall upon the sidewalks of life, I skin my knees, I bleed. And the second poem is Spanish as an experience by a native speaker, John Ol Oliveras Espinzo. A George Washington quarter was a corta. Two cortas bought us una soda from, ven from a vending machine. We asked Ableto for a corta to play the video game console. No, he said, una pesta, no una corta. Una pesta para la maquina. He called the console a machine, like the machine, machina, that dropped a quarta every six cans mother put, mother put in. La machina is what father had us puchar across yardas on the weekends. We ate lunch, eh? At school, we ate lunch. At home, we, but 
At home, we ate both. Yuki was served on birthdays. It was Ben Gacho to have your birthday skipped again. Skipar was one of the unsolvable math problems, which was never attempted again. Half of our time was spent on homework, and the other half was spent watching Indo TV. Watch us sig- signaled you were about to do something impressive, but foolish, like a bike stunt. Mashale is what your friends tell you when you nearly plow into them with your bike. A bika is a bike is a bika. Uncle Jesse pedaled a bika to the grocery store to buy leche un con fles. Leche, not tortillas, were heated in the microwave. A gue is a dude. Uncle Beto called more than two people. Una bola de gajis. I secretly listened to the Beastie Boys in my in Uncle Beto's troca because I could turn it up full blast. Uncle Jesse's pedals back from Kimar, Kimar with two new plaid shirts. Dad's returning from his trip to the Dompe, where he left where he left last week's garbage. Mother's fixing spam sandwiches. Ableto pulls a pocket from his fiesta, but hands me a corta. This is a Where I'm From poem by Kwame Alexander, impersonating Muhammad Ali. I am from black Cadillacs, from plastic covered sofas, and tiny pink houses. I am from the one bathroom we all shared, and the living room you stayed out of. I am from Friday fried fish and chocolate birthday cakes, from Le- from Levy Brothers slacks and shiny white shoes, from Cash and Bird, from storytellers and good looks, from you don't say you can't until you try. I'm from the Kentucky Derby and the land of baseball bats. I'm from the two clashiest clays before me, one white, one black. I'm from slavery to freedom. I am from the West End to Smoketown, from unfilled dreams of my father to the hallelujah hopes of my mama. Poem number two. This is I Asked My Mother to Sing by Lee Young Lee. She begins and my mother and my grandmother joins her. Mother and daughter sing like young girls. If my father were alive, he would play the accordion and sway like a bit. I've never been to Peking or the Summer Palace, nor stood on Great Stone Boat to watch the rain go the rain began on Kuning Lake, Q, on Kuning Lake. The picnickers running away in the grass. I only love to hear it sung. How the water lilies fill with rain until they overturn, spilling water into water. They rock back and fill. They rock back and fill with more water. Both women begun to cry. But neither stops their song. Two by Rajani LaRocca. I have two lives, one that is Indian, one that is not. I have two best friends, one who is Indian, one that is not. At school, I swim in a river of white skin and blonde hair and brown hair, and blue eyes and green eyes and hazel. School subjects and giggles about boys, salads and sandwiches. And on weekends, I float in a sea of brown skin and black hair and dark eyes, MTV music videos and giggles about boys, samosas and sabjis. In both places, I have gossip and laughter, music and silence, friendship. But in only one place do I have my parents. Knoxville, Tennessee by Nikki Giovanni. I always like summer best. You can eat fresh corn from daddy's garden and okra and greens and cabbage and lots of barbecue and buttermilk and homemade ice cream at the church picnic and listen to gospel music 
outside at the church homecoming and go to the mountains with your grandmother and go barefooted and be warm all the time not only when you go to bed and sleep. Where I'm from, by George Ella Lyon. I'm from clothespins from Clorox and carbon tetrachloride. I'm from the dirt under the back porch, black, glistening. It tasted like beets. I'm from the forsythia bush, the Dutch elm, whose long gone limbs I remember as if they were my own. I'm from fudge and eyeglasses from Imogene and Alifair. I'm from the know-it-alls and pass-it-ons, from perk up and pipe down. I'm from he restoreth my soul with cotton ball lamb. In 10 verses, I can say myself. I'm from Artemis and Billy's branch, fried corn and strong coffee. From the finger my grandfather lost to the auger, the eye my father kept shut to keep his sight. Under my bed was a dress box spilling old pictures, a sift of lost faces to drift, to drift beneath my dreams. I'm from those moments, snap before I budded, leaf fall from the family tree. Okay. Spanish as an experience as experienced by a native speaker by John Olivares Espinosa. A George Washington quarter was a cuarta. Two, two cuartas bought us a soda from a vending machine. We asked Abuelito for a cuarta to play the video game console. No, he said, una peseta. No, una cuarta. Una peseta para la máquina. He called the console a machine, like the machine máquina that dropped a cuarta for every six cans mother put in. La máquina is what father had us pushar across the yardas on the weekends. At work, we ate lonche. At school, we ate lunch. At home, we ate both. Cueki was served on birthdays. It was being gaucho to have your birthday skipped again. Skip, skipiar was done to the unsolvable math problem, which was never t attempted again. Half of our time we spent on homework. The other half we spent watching the TV. Watch a single you were about to do something impressive, but foolish, like a, bi like a bike stunt. Watch a lit is what your friends tell you when you nearly plow them into your into them when you need to plow into them with your bike. A bike is a bica. Uncle Jesse pedaled a bica to the grocery store to buy leche y cornflakes. Leche, not tortillas, were heating in the microwave. Un güey es un dude. Uncle Beto called more than two people una bola de güeyes. I secretly listened to the Beastie Boys and Uncle Beto's troca because I could turn it up full blast. Uncle Jesse pedals back from Guaymar with two new plaid shirts. Dad's returning from his trip to the Dompe where he left last week's garbage. Mother's fixing the spam sanguches. Abuelito pulls from his pocket a peseta but then hands me a cuarta. Um, I'm reading Caged Bird by Maya Angelou. A free bird leaps on the back of of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. 
But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through the bars of his rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a, fe with a fearful trill of things unknown, but he longed for still. His tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze, and the trade winds soft through the singing trees, and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams, his shadow shouts on a nightmare scream, his wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird the cage bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but long for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. Thank you. Hi, I'm Georgia, and this is Ellington Was Not a Street by Satsek Shang. It hasn't always been this way. Ellington was not a street. Robinson, no mere memory. Du Bois walked up my father's stairs. Hum some tune over me, sleeping in the company of men who change the world. It wasn't always like this. Why, Ray Barreto used to be a side man, and Dizzy's hair was not always gray. I remember. I was there. I listened in the company of men. Politics as necessary as collards, music even in our dreams. Our house was filled with all kind of folks. Our windows were not cement or steel. Our doors open like our daddy's arms held us safe and loved. Children growing in the company of men old southern men and young slick ones. Sonny Till was not a boy. The Clovers no ragtag orphans. Our crooners, we belong to a whole world. Rukma was no foreigner. Virgil Atkins, Virgil Akins was not the only fighter. It hasn't always been this way. Ellington was not a street. That's right. Uh, I'll close out today. Uh, this is a poem uh, by Caribbean poets named Derek Walcott. Um, and it's a great poem to close this out with because it's a poem 
that uh, tells the story of young people encountering an older storyteller uh, and being mesmerized. With the frenzy of an old, with the frenzy of an old snake shedding its skin, the speckled road scored with ruts, smelling of mold, twisted on itself and re-entered the forest, where the Dacian leaves thicken and folk stories begin. Sunset would threaten us as we climbed closer to her house up the asphalt hill road, where yam vines wrangled over gutters with the dark reek of moss, the shutters closing like the eyelids of that mimosa called T. Marie, then lucent as paper lanterns, lamplight glowed through the ribs, house after house, there was her own lamp at the black twist of the path. There's childhood, and there's childhood's aftermath. She began to remember at the minute of the fireflies to the sound of pipe water banging in kerosene tins, stories she told to my brother and myself. Her leaves were libraries of the Caribbean. The luck was ours, those fragrant origins. Her head was magnificent. Sidon, in the gully of her voice, shadows stood up and walked. Her voice travels my shelves. She was the lamplight in the stare of two mesmerized boys, still joined in one shadow, indivisible twins. Thanks, Derek Walcott. <laughs>